Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. We are coming back at you, um, following up on the last episode that we did, which was talking about the menu setup and customization of the SL2 and SL2S. Mm -hmm. And today, what are we going to talk about? Today's episode, uh, which is the menu episode two, episode something like part that, yeah. two menu of, is all about the Q2 and the Q2 monochrome. So we are going to be talking about settings, tips and tricks, and going through the menu. We covered a lot of ground on the SL2. We did. Um, and before we really dive into the Q2 today, there's actually a little bit of <laughs> SL2 business to to wrap up. And as David was joking about earlier, <laughs> we don't every, know. <laughs> every episode is, is always like, what's coming next? Right. When's like going to do this? And you know, we get it. And we always say, we don't know. Well, as evidenced by the fact that there was a huge update for the SL2 and the SL2S firmware. Hold on. Before you go too far, yeah. what haven't we done? We didn't do our intro. We always forget to do the intro. Why? They know who, they know who we are. Do they, though? <laughs> okay, for those that don't know, before Josh dives into that, I'm David Farkas. <laughs> That's Josh Lair. And over there, the man of the box, right there, is Jose Rivera. Hello. Yes. Hello. All right. We're now they know. Now they know. For, they didn't and know. And now, anyway. if you didn't know, anyway, now um, you know. Yes, welcome. So, we're just getting right down to business here, because okay. we got a lot of go ground on. to cover. So, anyway... There was a huge firmware update for the SL2 and the SL2S mm -hmm. after we did an entire show on those cameras. So clear, Day, days yeah, later, clearly we had no idea it was coming, and we we're blindsided by it because we would have waited uh, until that. So anyway, there was a couple of cool <laughs> new features, and David's going to very quickly cover them just so that we can kind of include those in our channel. But don't worry, the next two hours are going to be all about the Q2. So yes. if you don't have an SL2 but are curious about these changes, check them out because they're cool. If you have an SL2, definitely check them out because, well, yeah. Yeah, that's why. Okay. Whoops. There's a little bit of tripod reconfiguration here. A little bit, a little bit. So and also, um, while David's fiddling, we are here on a Sunday night as opposed to a Saturday. We yeah, are, it's not we Saturday. are, it's not actually. Oh, shoot. So we're going to be experimenting with different times and days for the show as we just try to mix things up a little bit. Um, obviously, we're always looking for feedback. If you prefer a certain day or time, I realize there's a lot of people from all over the world that watch this and would like us to do it at 6 a.m. on a Tuesday, but, you know, <laughs> we're busy. So <laughs> how are we doing over there? I wish I had a smaller lens. Oh, well, you brought the biggest lens possible, yes. Yeah. No, uh great. Go great. Uh, kind of. Take the cap off. That'll make it smaller. That'll make it shorter. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. That'll be really helpful. Cool. Uh huh. It's doing great. Okay. I'm just gonna raise the tripod up just to squeak. Okay. David is just tweaking. He's tweaking. Here we go. Just make sure it doesn't fall over like last Yeah. Time. You mean like that? <laughs> well, I can can't see fall how prepared. How prepared, how prepared we are. Um, well, it definitely can't fall too far it, over. It, it's the one hour earlier thing. It's a screw. Oh yeah. Yeah. The and Sunday. Totally. Like, we're totally messing up. Usually we rest on Sunday. Yes. Okay. So um, the first thing about the, the new firm that came out, I'm just going to pop over to Red Dot Forum just so you guys can see. Yeah, Jose went up. Thank you. Okay, so we have here the, the SL2, SL2S, and the biggest news was that Leica added perspective control, or LPC for short. We, they introduced that on the M10 generation, the M10P, the M10R, the M10 monochrome, not the original M10 because it doesn't have a gyroscope in it. So uh, this is something that we had wanted to see for the SL2 for, for a while now, and they decided to deliver it days after we walked through all the other menu options. <laughs> great so that was, timing. That was great. You. So uh, this is firmware version 5 for the SL2 and version 4 for the SL2S. And perspective control, I can't really demonstrate it live because it's on a tripod shooting at a table. But essentially, I have an entire uh, article on this to show what it 
what it actually looks like. So when you are photographing something, you'll actually see a uh, not a rectangle, what should be a rectangle, but in sort of trapezoid form as you move around. And then when you take the picture, it applies a perspective correction. I would say um, David did a great article on perspective control when it came with the M10P uh, this one right and here, yeah. R. There we go. So if you want to actually see how it, it looks, works it looks like that. in action, check out the article there. Yeah. I have a link to it in the firmware. Yes. But you can see here. Well, how they just bring that up? OK, so this was me shooting that. And you can see that as I'm angling up towards the building, that there is this trapezoid because I'm not even this way or this way. So I'm sort of uh, tilting and angling back. But the, the final result is that it straightens the picture out. So check this article out if you're not familiar with perspective control. And uh, yeah, but going back to, to this, that's the big change, the headlining feature. But I think the, the really nice feature is this, which is, and I will show you live. This is to, the option has been added to customize the options that are toggled on and off for the assignable function buttons on the SL2 and the SL2S. In the last major firmware update, version uh, 4 and version 3, respectively, mm -hmm. Leica added just all the options. So yeah. they went from, I think, 13 options no, to... No, like 30-something to 50-something? 50 50, there's 56 yeah. now. And and fittingly, this feature that David's about to show you has always been available on the Q2 that we're talking about tonight. But we didn't get it on the SL2, and we never really understood why. But it now, doesn't matter now, because now we have it. Okay. Show him, David. I'm going to show you. All right. He's going to show Here you. Here we go. So let's go. Let's go back there live go. in the camera. Very nice. Oh, I like switching sides of the screen. That's really nice. Very fancy. Okay, so here in the menu, and I, I'm gonna kind of just tilt that up just a little bit so you can see. Yeah. I'm gonna go through here, and this is factory fresh with the the new firmware. So nothing's been changed on this. It's all default values, and I can either scroll down as we we talked about there using the joystick. The other quick method is to use the the wheel, which will send you over page down. And if we go back to customize control here on page three, you can now go to function buttons. And I'm using the joystick and just pushing to the right to confirm that. Whoop. What? There nope, right there. OK. And what you see here is very similar to what Leica does in the favorites customization. So in the favorites menu, you can toggle everything off to not have a favorites menu, or you can just toggle a few options on, which will give you uh, your, your most things. We talked about that in the last episode. So here, let's say I don't care about photo and video, uh, info levels I do keep, uh, share a magnification I'll keep, drive mode I do keep, interval I'll turn off, multi-shot. And, and one of the things, I'll just briefly touch on this, it's not a toggle for interval shooting or for multi-shot, that's actually drive mode. What these options are is the menu to customize the options for these functions. Generally speaking, once you set them up, you don't need to change them very often. So that's why I'm toggling them off. Uh, same goes with exposure bracketing. That's through drive mode. Yeah, self we don't have to go through the whole You got thing. it, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to... Yeah, essentially, the short version of this is it makes the list of options oh. you have when you, act, when you bring up the list of things you could change for each function button. It makes that list much shorter because previously you'd have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll to customize your buttons. So if there are certain settings you know you're never going to want to assign to a custom function button, you literally just cut them off in this menu and they'll never show up in that list. And that just saves you time. I think we should get to the Q2. I yeah, would, I'm going to show them what it looks like I, here. I can, I can see people are like, why are you talking about the SL2 <laughs> when we're doing the Q2 episode? That's fine. So let me, uh, let me just finish uh, this real quick so you can see what it actually looks like. And go, wow, there's so many. There are so many options here. Okay, we, we get it. Although we just talked about perspective control, so we're going to leave that on. Okay, I think that's good. And, well, we don't want to any of that. Uh, okay. There's like three more pages. We don't have time for this. <laughs> David, come on. <laughs> I'm working we on it, man. we got to get to the topic of the show. I'm working on it. Oh, here we go. Okay, we're done. We're done. All right. That, we're, not uh, done. we're not done. I told you. Oh, my gosh. So many things. Okay, now. Now that we are done customizing that, so now when I go to assign a function button by pushing and holding it in, you notice we don't have 50 options. I've now narrowed it down to just ones that I might use, like ISO, drive mode, magnification, things like that. So this is 
a really nice, clean way to do this. It's not just on this function button on the back, but also any of the ones up here, the two up top, as well as the two on the front, and also next to the um, viewfinder. So there's six in total for the SL2. Yet another reason to update your firmware. Please, yeah. please do that. And, and we have a whole episode about how to do that. If you haven't watched it and your firmware is out of date, yep. please watch it and update your firmware. And I'm just going to show one other thing real quick without... Okay. One other thing real quick. So let's jump back here. The other change was in the uh, lens profiles for non-native L-mount Leica lenses. And you can get to that using... Where is it? Camera settings. It is, all the way over here. So in camera settings on page 5... And we go to... Well, you can't do it now. Oh, I can't. Have, right. Okay, well. well yeah. Anyway, it is in there. Uh, I'd have to take the lens off. But it allows you, if you come over to the screen, I'll show you. So it allows you to set just, just basically generic focal length choices. If you have a lens that is not an M lens that's in the catalog, let's say you want to use some brand X or brand V or some weird, mm -hmm. some weird specialty lens, you can now select the focal length so the EXIF data will be correct. And also the image stabilization algorithm will work properly because it does need focal length data to do that. And now... Can we talk about the Q2 now, please? Without further ado, <laughs> let's come back to us here <laughs> while I make the change over now to the top. Now for the reason you tuned in, which is the like a Q2. Now, we've gone over the Q2 more than once in terms of explaining what the camera is. This episode is focused on the menu. Now, what we're not going to do is talk about the instruction manual for two hours, right? So this isn't every setting, every feature, and every function. We're going to go through the menu. And we've got some time, so we can dive pretty deep. Um, we're probably not going to cover video. There may be some things that we skip over in the sense of we're a little bit kind of go, go through them faster. Some things we may, uh, we'll spend more time on. Obviously, if you have questions about something we covered or didn't cover, just throw it in the chat and Jose will catch it and we'll, we'll do our best to, to get to it. So again, this isn't going through every single setting in the Q2 from start to finish, more so as us kind of giving you a guide how to set up the camera um, once you get it out of the box. Now, most of the settings between the Q2 and the Q2 monochrome will be the same. There are a few, one or two really, settings on the Q2 monochrome that are specific to that camera, which we'll cover probably at the end of the show. Uh, otherwise, functionally, the two cameras are identical. So yeah. um, keep that in mind. Except um, for color modes. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's almost, right. almost, almost the same. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is reset our cameras to the factory defaults so that we're kind of starting from the way you would get it out of the box. Um, I'm going to show you how to do that. So first, uh, we turn the camera on. Let me just start with that. So we turn the camera on here. And then we hit menu, menu. And then I'm actually going to scroll. Sorry, menu, one more time. You can see I'm on the first page of the main menu. I'm going to hit up. And that's going to take me to reset camera here. Reset camera settings, yes. Reset user profiles, reset all the things, all the things. Restart. There we go. We get the cool animation. Ooh, fun. This is what you're paying for when you buy a Q2. This. Look at that. Look at, look at that. It's amazing. I mean, they have to make this for every single camera. Like, somebody, some, some designer. It's like, okay. Some designer. <laughs> Language English. I'm not going to worry about the time right now because it doesn't matter. So. Now we are in factory defaults for the Q2, and you can see we've got live view going. In theory, this is this episode will be a little more streamlined compared to the SL2 because there's not quite as much in the Q2 menu. But interestingly, there are a lot of similarities in how the menu is designed. So if you watch the SL2 episode and the Q2 episode, you'll see a lot of crossover um, in the two uh, menus and the way that the cameras work. So I actually want to talk quickly about um, a, a physical setting before we dive into the menu, just because we do get this question um, every now and then, which is you'll get a Q or a Q2, this is, applies to both, and you, you're not able to activate the autofocus. You know, some will say, I can't get it to focus, I'm half pressing the shutter. Uh, but Q2 is unique, and the Q and the Q2 are unique in that there's a physical manual focus ring on the lens, which is, you know, kind of fits with the Leica aesthetic. Uh, however, I like Gestalt. Gestalt, yeah. <laughs> the the focus ring has a lock a locking mechanism, so you don't accidentally engage manual focus while you're out and about. Now, if you have the lens turned all the way but not actually locked, you're still going to be in manual focus mode. I'll probably show this. 
Maybe. I don't want to like mess up my positioning just, too much. Yeah, just take the camera away. Yeah, it's fine. Here we go. Show the other one. Hold on. There we go. We got this. Perfect. So that's blocking him. Blocking my light. <laughs> it's blocking. Okay, okay. <laughs> so if you if you I just want to cover this because we get this question often enough. So right now you can see I am in autofocus because the AF letters are perfectly lined up with this center line. There is a button on the focus tab. Let's see if I can get it. There it is, right there. Infinity lock. Uh, yeah, this harkens back to the infinity exactly. locks on, on older M lenses. So when I press that button, it disengages the lock and I can freely rotate the manual focus ring on the cue. Now, if I were to put it over here, but not actually fully engage it, it looks a quick like a quick glance, you'd be like, oh, I'm in autofocus, but you wouldn't actually be able to autofocus because you're actually still in manual focus mode. So you want to just kind of hold that button down and get it all the way over there so that AF is lined up. Now, if you can't turn the ring, that means you're locked. If the ring still has, or you can still rotate it, you're in manual manual focus mode still. So this isn't really as much of an issue on new cameras because they'll come out of the box in AF. But if you buy a used one, you borrow somebody's camera or whatever, and you're noticing that the autofocus isn't activating, this is um, one of the reasons. Uh, the other lens-related tip I'm going to give is you always want to make sure your macro ring is fully engaged in either position. If you have it kind of like offset or halfway, you're going to see a black screen on the camera and you may think something's wrong. So those are kind of the two troubleshooting things is make sure your focus ring is in fact locked in on AF and also make sure your macro ring is firmly engaged in the one of the two positions. So, I mean, that'll warn you. Um, the warning will go away though. Uh, so okay. if you don't pay attention okay. really, really yeah, quickly, yeah. yeah. So anyway, those two things. And now let me grab my Q2. Carefully. Carefully, position it perfectly. Just, just so, I think. How's that? Good? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to drive somebody really crazy out there. <laughs> It'll drive me crazy. <laughs> All, right. All right, so now we're back with the Q2, and I'm going to get us started here. The first menu press brings us to the quick menu, which David and I both talked a lot about on the SL2 episode. And essentially, this is a touch-sensitive combination of, of a menu interface with a status display. So you can see your relevant shooting information, shooting mode, shutter speed aperture, ISO, light meter, whether you're in photo or video mode, and the focal length in terms of you have one of the crop modes engaged, uh, battery life, and card status. Yeah, you also have a couple of touch-sensitive buttons here. We got this question on the last one. No, these are not movable or configurable. I hope one day that happens. I'm assuming there's a reason that we don't know about that they're not, but no, you cannot actually change the configuration of these touch sensitive icons here. If you want to get- wait, wait, But wait, maybe like by Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> like, wouldn't that be great? Uh, uh, yeah, no, not really. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> to get into the main menu, after you see the quick menu, simply hit the menu button again. And now you're actually in the favorites menu, which you can see for two different ways. One, it says favorites here on the top left. And also you get the little star icon uh, on the top right. I hit menu one more time, and that's going to take me into the actual main menu on the first page. And I'll kick it over to David, who's going to uh, tell you about the different things you see in the drive mode menu. Ooh, drive mode. Yes. Men oh, my camera's crooked now. All righty. There we go. So in the drive mode menu, uh, again, very similar to the SL2, SL2S. And we have uh, single, continue, various continuous, so low speed, medium speed, high speed, very high speed, interval shooting, and exposure bracketing. Where it varies from the SL2 is that self-timer is not in this list. Self-timer is actually a separate option in the Q2. Uh, it's separated out of drive mode, which is an interesting choice, but uh, it is worthwhile to know the difference if you're using both these cameras side by side. You do have to set up self-timer separately. Uh, I primarily just use single. That's, you know, one press of the shutter is one picture, and you can push it pretty quickly. I I don't actually know offhand. Josh, do you know offhand the, the various speeds for low, medium, high, and very high? Uh, I think it's 3, 5, 10, and 20. I should know this, but I don't. Um, what I do know is that in the... And I talked about this on the SL2 episode as well. On the high speed and very high speed settings, you do not get autofocus, metering, and white balance in between images. Right. That's something I always like to mention. So if you're shooting a sequence of something, let's say a person running towards you or a dog or a car, and you're going to need changes in focus and or white balance or exposure in between each one of the shots in the burst mode, 
do not use high speed or very high speed because what those modes do is the focus point and the aperture and, and the white balance and the exposure are locked from the first shot in the sequence and stay that way until you're done shooting. Um, so keep that in mind. High speed uses the electronic shutter, mm -hmm. so that's going to be the fastest. I think it's 20 frames a second. It's very fast. Yeah. I rarely use high or very high because what am I photographing that has that that's going that fast with a Q2? Right. Like I can see that on SL2, which is more geared towards like action and stuff. But medium is for me or low more than enough. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, where low speed, medium speed come in handy is let's say you're also trying to handhold something really slowly. Mm. If you put it on low, you know, old trick is put on low speed, push down, and just take just a short burst. One of those should be pretty sharp. You know, you have a higher likelihood of getting a sharper picture at borderline shutter speeds than you do if you're just taking a single shot and and actually pressing the camera and making it and making it move. Speaking of moving, whoops. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Uh, you wonder how David drops stuff. There you go. There, there we go. Okay. Sense. Now interval shooting. We talked about that. So let's just go over that briefly. Interval well, shooting. We, talk we talked about it in the previous episode. Well, if they didn't have an SL2, they didn't want well, to. We, no, we got to be thorough. Right. We got to be okay. owe it to the people, David. So interval shooting. What that means is, oh, and that's. Yeah, if you see, just so you, well, I'm going to mention this right now. If you see our screens go black, I apologize in advance. It's because we're kind of covering the EVF sensor. Yes. We will probably change that. Yeah. Probably. I just So that it doesn't do that, but. That's a good, that's don't, a good safety. Don't tip. get mad at us. Okay. <laughs> it goes black for a second. And it's okay. turning off. And it turned off. That's yeah. fine. Same battery. Remember, default settings, auto off in one minute. Exactly. Okay, so number of frames. And interestingly, this defaults to 300, which is quite a lot. <laughs> that is a very intense you, time you, lapse. It is a very intense time lapse. So what you can do. And this is either for time-lapse photography where you're going to animate it later. Think of clouds going overhead or the sun rising through the day. This is a really cool feature. And most people aren't going to be that committed to leave their camera in one spot for that long and then have to animate those images later. Where I find it to be the most useful is actually for doing group photos mm -hmm. where I'm part of that group. So I'll dial in and say, okay, I want to shoot 20 frames, and you can either use the uh, the direction pad here, or I could also, <laughs> interestingly, yep, yeah, there we go. I could also use the touch yeah. touch display as well to just punch in 20. I think our fingers are too fat. Yeah, there we go. You need to have skinnier fingers for this. There you go. No, both of us. And then, and then interval, <laughs> you can set it here in hours, minutes, and seconds. If you want the most annoyed group of people ever just said it one minute intervals wait 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 guys in one minute it'll take another picture <laughs> now so i what i'll do is I'll, I'll stay at the default of two seconds so it's going to take one picture every two seconds or 20 pictures and everyone can just smile and then you know halfway through you do something fun there's a great way to take group photos and then your countdown here so the first image isn't just you walking into the frame is i'll set this Using the so the up and down arrows here set the time. So I'll set a 10 second timer. That's basically a 10 second self timer. Then it'll start shooting the sequence. Super useful. Just be sure to turn it off after you're done with it by setting it back to single. And then exposure bracketing works the same way as pretty much all the Leicas. The first thing you can select is number of frames. So you can either select three or five. And I'm using the direction pad here. So the left and right change the setting and up and down go between the settings and here number of ev steps so my preferred method of exposure bracketing is pretty much the same on all leicas which is three shots two steps apart two ev and exposure compensation you don't have to set it here you can actually set whatever exposure compensation for the image and it will pass through here and then um, automatic is on, meaning once I push the shutter shutter button release once, it'll fire the entire sequence. If you turn this off, you have to press every single time between every one of these three images. And I don't even, I can't think of a reasonable use case why you wouldn't want automatic, but somebody out there probably does. I'd suggest leaving this in on. So my settings is, is three shots, two exposure value, or two EV apart, two stops, which will spread your dynamic range. Essentially, when you blend this in HDR in Lightroom or Photoshop, you're getting four stops more dynamic range because one, 
two, three, or one, two, three, four, right? Four stops more dynamic range than if you shot one image. And uh, this is definitely very useful here. Okay, so now that is, is drive mode. And now drive mode is sticky, so meaning whatever you set it to is going to stay there uh, until you change it yourself. So it's important to keep that in mind. If you set it to exposure bracketing and forget to change it back to single, and you go on your merry way and start taking images, it's going to start doing like you know three frames in a row. Every time you press the shutter button, you're going to be like, "Wait, what's happening?" So um, you know, keep an eye out because you can see um, on the sort of top left middle here that little icon that's going to tell you the mode that you're in. So that's in single, so you can use that as a, as a reference point. You also see it when you are in the quick menu. It is right here in the middle. So if I were to tap that, I can also change my drive modes here. I would say, for me, single is what I use overwhelmingly the most, and then other things from there. But single by far for me. Um, so there's two different ways to quickly see what your drive mode setting is. Because um, again, you don't want to leave it in anything other than single pretty much most of the time because it will stay there and then it'll mess you up. So, yeah. Um, all right, back to the main menu. So that was drive mode. Now, one of the things that the Q2 does that the SL2 doesn't do is it takes self timer and removes it from the drive mode settings, which said, is a yeah. totally, totally logical thing to do in my mind. So that means you can have exposure bracketing and self timer or yes. a, whatever. So if you want the self timer, you simply go to a self timer and you can turn it on to two seconds or 12 seconds. I've talked about this hack before, but also if you want a timer that's different than two or 12, you can use interval and simply set it to shoot one frame. And then whatever your countdown is, is your self timer. So if you want a 25 second self timer, you simply set your interval to take one frame and the countdown to be 25 seconds and boom, you've got a custom self timer. But for me, I like that. Two seconds is generally fine. It would have to be, I don't know why I would use 12 on the Q2, but... Well, because you'd have to run really far away for a self-portrait ah, on I a see, mountain. I see. Okay. Yeah. Probably use a Photos app for that. Uh, all right. So that's self-timer. And next, we've got a big one here, which, of course, is focusing. Now, we've got a few different settings in the focusing menu. I will start um, on this one here. Your focus mode, of which you have two. AFS for single. AFC for continuous. Simply meaning if you have it in AFS and you half press the shutter, the focus is activated once and then locked. If you have it on AFC, when you half press the shutter, the focus is continuously going. So whatever is underneath the focus point, the camera is going to keep focusing on whatever's underneath there until you actually fire the shutter. So for moving subjects, AFC is ideal, but otherwise 99% of the time I'm going to be in AFS just because I'm not really shooting a lot of sports with the Q2. Um, I guess for street photos, maybe? Yeah, street shots. Somebody's walking. Okay. Anyway, uh, the next one, this is where I see a lot of uh, mistakes get made. So I'm going to dive into this a little bit. AF mode. So this is different from focus mode. This is not single or continuous. This is describing what the camera is doing to identify your subject for focusing. The default out of the box is multi field, which is essentially the camera deciding on its own accord where it's going to put the focus points and thus where. The image is going to be in focus. Now, you know what you're photographing, the camera doesn't. So I can't think of a time where I've ever used multi field. I, I generally can't. So the first thing I do when I take a Q2 out of the box or out of a reset is take it off of multi field for my AF mode. And, I'll, and I use uh, the same two modes I would use on the SL2 between spot or field. Those are two different modes that accomplish the same thing, which is instead of the camera arbitrarily deciding where it's going to focus, it's giving you a fixed point which you could move around, a, a single point that you could move around and decide on your own where you are going to focus the camera. So the difference between spot, which we'll show you first, is it's just, if you can see it, there it is. It's simply a crosshair that you can move throughout the frame like that. Go, oh, that might help. Uh, it's all the close. Wow, 28 millimeter. Yeah, yeah, right. You forget how wide this camera there is. There you go. You can also tap on the screen where you want the spot to go. If you double tap, it takes it right back to the center. I'll show you that one more time. So simply double tap on the screen. There we go. Puts it right back in the center. Um, now, spot is ideal for very small subjects. So if I'm photographing, say, the hood ornament of a car or a close up portrait and I want to get it right on the eye, spot is good for that. Uh, because it's so small, it 
can get confused in you know, areas of single tone or color. So it's not ideal for street shooting or, or walk around kind of photography because the camera may hunt a little bit. So for that, I'm going to actually use different AF mode. I'm going to use field. Field is a box like so. And this looks just like uh, the same it does on the SL2. I can use either the arrows to move the field around or I can tap on the screen where I want it to go. I can double tap just like with the spot to get it back into the center. This is going to look at a considerably larger area than the spot mode will. I'm just going to put the cap on. Um, there we go. But it's not going to be so big that it's going to confuse too much stuff. You can actually change the size of the field by pressing and holding on it. And you can see you get the little red arrows and I can use my thumb dial here to choose from three different sizes. There's a larger one and then there's a smaller one. I find myself using the smaller one quite a bit. David, which side do you size do you generally use? The middle one? I like the middle one. Yeah. Yeah. Middle one is 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 a sweet spot. I think it just comes down to personal preference. I balance between them. I don't say I I can't say I use the large one ever. I don't know why I would ever need that. Maybe if I was shooting something with a large like lots of large areas of single tones, like some kind of weird architecture, but um I could yeah, I mean I, I could think of using it for, let's say, a stand of trees or something like that, of mm -hmm. just shooting a, a wide landscape. And stuff is generally towards infinity and just high high frequency detail. Mm -hmm. But I don't see why the the medium and small wouldn't yeah. work for that either. I don't know. But look, it's there. So so, so yeah. I thought of where multi-field might come did in. Now? Okay. I did. Tell I me. did because yeah. I had time okay. sitting on this <laughs> off camera over here. Okay, talk to us. So one of the benefits of having a autofocus point and shoot like a Q2 mm -hmm. versus a larger camera like an SL2 or a manual focus like an M is it's kind of nice when you're traveling to be able to hand the camera off to a non-photographer mm -hmm. to take your picture or people you're with. I knew you were going to say that, but that's why we haven't gotten to the other right. mode yet. Tell, Tell me more about yeah, this. Well, I, what I was going to say was in the focusing mode, or the AF mode, what I would use for that would be the face detection. And I'd do the same sure. with the SL2 because if you're handing the camera off to someone- They don't know anything. To take your picture, right. well, hopefully you have a face. And so the face detection should be the way to go. So that's the mode that I would use if I knew I was gonna hand the camera off to someone with okay. the face detection. Because even with multi-field, if you're standing in front of a big building- Oh yeah, it's gonna miss it's, you. Yeah, so that's that's not like worth it. If a car it. goes in front, it'll focus on the car. Yeah, whereas face detection is much more likely to get there, but we're not there yet. So I like that. Come back here. We can see, uh, thank you. We talked about the spot and the field. Again, I do generally use field the most, but either of those two will work fine. Just avoid multi-field. The tracking is essentially giving you a field size focusing spot. And what it will do is make its best effort to stay on top of whatever it is you initially half press over it. So for example, if it's a dog running around and you put the dog under the focus spot and you half press to engage the autofocus. And by the way, this will automatically always be an autofocus continuous regardless of the setting above it. So even if you have the camera in AFS, putting it in tracking is going to switch it over to AFC internally. I don't think the menu will change, but- Yeah, and the uh, other thing to, that's worth noting here yes. as well is that you have to be, uh, you have to push and hold mm -hmm. the whole time. So once you, let's say I was locking on that uh, Enzo, the yeah. dog, right? Yeah. Okay, I would, the box would turn green after half pressing it, it's gonna be white and then it'll turn green. And then I have to keep half pressing the shutter down while the subject is moving around the frame. And you'll see the box sort of flickering and fluttering around following it. I can actually demonstrate this. Um, can you focus close enough? I, I'll put it in macro mode. There you go. Okay. So I'm actually gonna show you how Let's this see works. Let's see a lot. So this is my super awesome tripod plate, which is going to be my dog for the sake of this demonstration. <laughs> so if I half press and it is now green and I'm continuing to keep my finger halfway on the shutter, if I were to move this around, you can see that the tracking is doing its best. It's doing pretty well, actually. Not an ideal scenario, but you can see it is actually, and again, I'm just continuing to have my finger halfway pressed. So it's simply going to track your subject around the frame. As soon as you release, the default behavior is to bring it back to the center. You can actually change that to, to bring it to either where you started, if you didn't start in the center, or where it left off. So let's say you left at the edge of the frame, that's where it will leave it. So you do have the ability to change that, which we'll get to. 
Um, so that's tracking. And face detection is pretty obvious. It detects a face. If it doesn't detect a face, it reverts to field, which you can see here. Put the cap back on. Stay with me here. Um, so yeah, you can see that even though I'm in face detection, it is in field right now because there is no face. So yeah. Um, the next setting we have in focusing is AF assist lamp. Pretty straightforward. If the camera is in a very low light situation and it needs a bit of uh, helping hand to activate the autofocus, AF assist lamp will come on, throw a little bit of light. If you're in a scenario where that is not ideal, like at a ballet or somewhere where you have to be very discreet, you'll turn that off. Otherwise, I pretty much leave it on all the time. Um, I, I am curious. Yes. Oh, you want to see if that yeah, works? Now, now, here. Okay, okay. I don't know who this guy is. Yeah, the innocent have been protected. Let me just... <laughs> not sure. Macro ring, not in correct position. There you go. There's the oh, error. There we go. Uh-oh. Oh, my cap is on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm doing great. Let's oh, you see, let's I think see. you have to tilt this. Here. Yeah, I'm going to. I just want to make sure I'm in the right mode here. Okay. There you go. Let's see. Yeah, look, see? Look, it's actually tracking. Kind of tracking the face. It is. It is. This is literally a picture of David on a phone. <laughs> And it's, it's doing it's, pretty it's well. Pretty, it's yeah. doing okay. It, like, it's, it's trying. I think they get it. Yeah. I think everyone knows what, a, what face detection is. But it is, works. It works. Actually. So, yes, it does. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Uh, where are those beers at? Um, <laughs> so, okay. So that was a uh, assist lamp. Uh, the next item in the focusing menu is focus assist. David, do you want to tell us what that does? Sure. That's easy. Okay. Okay. So we're here on my camera. Okay. So... Focus Assist, let me go back in there just so you can see, for Focus Assist, and that's a sub-menu, and it's going to have two options, Auto Magnification and Focus Peaking. These are primarily designed, I should say, only designed when you're in manual focus. So by default, you can see that this is on, or does that say off? That says off. Okay, now if we're on and we go into Focus Peaking, here's where you can change your Focus Peaking color or disable Focus Peaking entirely. I am personally not a huge fan of focus peaking, but I know a lot of people are. And for me, I'm going to turn that off, but I would like auto magnification on. So my preferred setting is going to be this, which is magnification on, focus peaking off completely. And what that means is if I'm here and I unlock the focus, you'll see that it automatically, you'll see this little box here, it magnified that section. And I can also drag that around using this, the direction pad, to change where it's magnified. And I can change the magnification level using the dial. So now I'm more, whoop, there we go. Actually, you cannot. No, you have to, no, you're thinking uh, of the SL. Uh, oh, I'm thinking of the center oh. button. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so that changes the magnification. Sorry, not here. I know, David has SL on the right like, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. <laughs> still, I'm still back there. That's okay. Okay, so you can toggle between sort of a medium and 100%. Um, and it will go away automatically when I after five seconds. Yeah, when I when I stop touching it, now it's gone back. So just to go back and go back into focusing and focus assist. So that's what auto magnification does. And then focus peaking was on, which we can select any of the colors here: red, green, blue, or white. Uh, some of that's personal preference. You might have just gotten used to red focus peaking from an M camera or green focus peaking from early mirrorless cameras. I don't, I can't see that white would be extraordinarily practical. That is, uh, because there's usually white in some yeah, when image. Would you, when would you need white focus I, peaking? I can't, I don't know. Someone, someone watching the show definitely uses I know, that's it really sure. odd. Because on, <laughs> on previous Leica cameras, really, we've only had red, green, and blue. Right. Uh, they, they put that in there for some, for a reason, though. The, the whole idea of focus peaking is, you know, it's that, that shimmer around high contrast areas, around edges, and you typically have the choice of red, green, or blue to make sure that you have a contrasting color versus the subject that you're shooting. Mm. If you're shooting a person, red works okay because nobody's bright red, but green also works because it, it contrasts nicely against skin tones. But if you're in, na in nature and you're shooting a bunch of green trees, you want red, right? So it's pretty obvious. Select the one that is best suited towards the subject matter that you're shooting or like me, just turn it off. Yeah, I mean, I have the same. I, I am not a focus peaking guy because focus peaking works on contrast, but the highest contrast object in the frame isn't always the thing that you're trying to focus on. So I find that it kind of gets in my way. But honestly, I very rarely use manual focus on the Q2 because the Q2 is so competent with autofocus. 
I use autofocus 90% of the time, 99% of the time. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, SL2 is different with M lenses maybe, but even with the SL2, I mean, in my mind, if I want to focus manually, I'm going to grab an M11 or an M10R or something Mm. if I'm like in that mindset. Now, I could see if I was shooting something in low light on a tripod and I didn't want to worry about the focus readjusting every time, fine, okay, put it in manual. But otherwise, no, I'm almost, almost always going to be in one of the autofocus modes. Um, so let me come back here to my menu. So for focusing, we cover, I'm just gonna put this on field. Oops, there we go. David covered focus assist. We have touch AF. Touch AF is the ability to choose on the screen using your finger where the focus point is going to fall in field or in spot. If you find yourself doing it often by mistake, then you would simply turn this off. If you like that feature, you could turn it on. Touch AF and release means it will also take the photo at the same time as it activates the autofocus. I'll show you that so you can see what that looks like. If I can get it to focus on something, let's see. There, see, so I tapped the screen and it not only did it focus where I tapped, but it also took a picture at the same time. I don't know why you would need this. Again, somebody probably watching is like, I use it all the time. I'm like, all right, cool, cool. Uh, But uh, I actually honestly turn this off most of the time just because I, don't know, I got fat, clumsy fingers, and I'm going to be touching things, and it just gets in my way. So, on a tripod, though, it's very handy because then you're looking at the screen; you're not using the EVF. Um, touch AF and easy in EVF is essentially allowing you to move the focus point around while you're looking through the viewfinder. Do you use this, David? On the SL2, you use this, right? On the SL2, I do use this. Uh, I don't really use this on the on the Q, though. Yeah. Yeah, and AF quick setting only is basically you can change the like because the, the press and hold function to change the size of the field to, that will allow you to do that, but not actually move the point around. It's getting very granular, but yeah, I just don't use it. I just try to avoid using the touchscreen on this camera, except in playback, just because I don't know it gets in my way. It's cool, but not for me. Um, and the last item in focusing is I touched on this very briefly. This is in the focus or the AF mode of tracking, where does the focus point end up once you release the half press on the shutter and and, and take your finger off? Does it snap back to the center? Does it go to where you started, which is recall? Or does it go to where you left off, which is last position? So that's purely up to what you're photographing. I generally use um, center just because then I know exactly where it is and when I'm gonna start shooting again. I'd say uh, just a quick counterpoint to that is, let's say that uh, to do last position, because when you take the picture, you're re- often releasing the shutter and it's going to lose focus. So if you do recall, or not recall, sorry, last position, uh, it will at least be in the same general vicinity of your subject and mm-hmm. you can reacquire much quicker, I think, than fo- than recomposing. And- yeah, I guess it depends if you're photographing something that's that's moving, yeah, that's staying I, yeah, put. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, good point. Um, so that pretty much covers, it does cover all of the is. focusing items. Okay. I'm going to kick it over to you, David. Let's uh, talk about exposure metering. Uh, Your favorite yeah. thing. I'm in favorites. Exposure metering. Okay, well, this one's this one's pretty simple. Uh, the recommendation that I used to make was for center-weighted metering. And I know we we went back and forth. Josh liked multi-field. I like center-weighted. But it doesn't matter because we both like highlight-weighted metering now. So exactly. it's a happy day. I loved seeing highlight-weighted metering come to the Q2 with firmware update, it's fantastic. I'm so happy it's here. I use it all the time now because I do have, you know, this is my Q2 monochrome mm-hmm. and I use this same function on my Q2 monochrome. So I highly, highly, highly recommend using highlight weighted metering. What that's doing is metering for the brightest parts of the image and weighting those. It's not entirely, like if you have a, a bright window in a dark room, it's not going to make the whole image so dark that you can't see anything and only preserve the highlight detail, but it's going to find, I'd say, a happy medium between seeing, you know, blowing out the window entirely where it's unrecoverable just to bring up all the shadows, but it's also not going to make the whole image, you know, six stops dark. So it will find somewhere in the middle and you probably, for those situations, still need to use exposure compensation. This isn't a replacement for that. It just helps get you much, much closer to ideal exposure. So check it out if you haven't already. Highly recommend that set. Uh, uh, this is an, yet another 
reason to update your firmware because highly weighted metering came through a firmware update. So if I haven't said it enough, please update your firmware because you get cool features like that. Yeah, I know, right? It's important to note, I'm sorry if I, if I somehow missed you talking about this, Yeah. Uh, but in the spot metering mode, the, the reason I don't like this, well, there's a few reasons, but the main reason is because the metering spot is linked to the focus point. I didn't and, cover it because I don't recommend it. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> but yes, but it I does. want to explain that because <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. I, so, if you're using spot metering, you're really locking yourself in, and that is just not my style. So, I agree with David. Highlight weighted metering is the bee's knees. I still use multi field sometimes. Depends on what I'm doing. Q2 monochrome. I'm more likely to use highlight weighted metering sure. than on the Q2 because of how important it is to protect your highlights. Um, and it's true. I see here a comment that highlight weighted metering still overexposes. That's true. That's that's why I mentioned that you have to use this as a starting point. It just gets you much, much closer. You still need to observe what's happening. And we're gonna, we are gonna get to that in terms of setting up a profile that has a uh, highlight warning mm -hmm. where you have the nice. um, highlight zebra warning. Okay, so, but that's not yet. That's to come. We're getting there. We're All getting right. there. So I could talk, exposure yeah. compensation is pretty easy. There it is. Well, you say it's easy, but I, I don't, I don't want to I don't, I don't everyone, ever use it on the menu. Everyone uses it, but, but right. give, for people that may not know what it is, give us a very, very quick explanation of exposure. Oh, well, there you go. You are, <laughs> you're biasing the metering by making it darker. If you go minus and plus this way, you'll notice that I'm using the dial here and the default behavior is I don't have to go into this as a menu option right from the main shooting screen. It's the exact same effect. Well. By default, in aperture primary, primary mode, yes. Which is how I'm using the camera. Yeah, primarily, primary. right. Yes. So that is, uh, you generally don't need to access You're in the, favorites. I am in favorites. <laughs> you generally don't need to access exposure compensation from here. You can either access it directly with the dial in aperture priority mode, or through the uh, the quick menu. You can just tap here and either use your finger. You can try to use your finger. Wow. There we go. You can use your finger. Now you see why we don't use the touch screen. It's just <laughs> well, I'm also at a, at a weird yeah, angle. Yeah, that's true. It's yeah. a little fiddly. I think I think this is uh, forgivable. But you can also use the dial here, and you'll notice it highlights it in red, which is really easy to see that you're adjusting that setting. So more often than not, I'm either setting it here, or I'm just taking a look through the viewfinder, or on the screen, and I'm adjusting it in real time, and either looking at my histogram, looking at my blown highlights, and just seeing what the image looks like. There you go. Okay. That is exposure compensation. It is. Next, 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 we have ISO. This is pretty self-explanatory. This is where you're going to decide your ISO setting. I usually assign this to a custom button, so it's rare for me to go into the menu to make this change, but here it is. You can see all of these settings that are available to you from 50 all the way to 50,000. I would say for me, 6400 is about as high as I go. Unless the situation is really dire and I need to get lower light than that, but yeah, that's about that's about my ceiling for the Q2. What would you say? Is the same or when do you go? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Jose's not. <laughs> what is Jose doing? I don't know. Not looking. Yeah, he's, he's dancing over there. Yeah, he's, what are we missing? Um, the wide shot. Oh, we'll talk about this just for a second. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Okay. So for ISO, hey, here we are. We <laughs> We're exist, still here. We, we are exist still here. in the same room. It's yes, amazing. It's amazing. Um, so for ISO on the Q2, mm. 3200, 6400, I think is safe. Okay. Uh, Q2 monochrome, because we are talking about Q2 monochrome as well, mm -hmm. 25,000. There you go. Um, or 12,500 if you're just really, you know, nervous. But 25,000, you can get great results on the Q2 monochrome. Uh, it, it, it is better at low light than the Q2. And if we have a whole article about that that David wrote. A whole article. We also did an episode on monochrome. We did an episode on Q2 monochrome. So you can check all those out. Yes. Sweet. But this is just talking about menu customizations. Yes. So, back... so are we going to cover auto ISO? Yes. Now, the next screen we're going to cover is one of the more, what's, I don't want to say convoluted, but one of the more best things. Best, but also a little bit like you got to be careful when you go through this. So. This is the auto ISO settings menu. This is where you're going to describe and limit the camera's behavior when your ISO is set to auto, automatic, meaning the camera is choosing the ISO you're going to use. Now, we don't use flash here very much, so I'm gonna, gonna kinda not talk about the last two, but the first two are very important. Maximum ISO. 
This is the highest setting that you're allowing the camera to choose on its own. I actually go with the default, which is 6400. I'm assuming you do the same. Yep. So this is, if you really have a low tolerance for high ISO noise, you may want to set this to 3200 or 1600, but then you're really limiting yourself in a low light situation. So as I've said about 87,000 times on the show, Hell, I will, again, I'll always take a picture with some grain, then a picture with blur, because I can fix or tolerate some high ISO noise. What I can't tolerate is my shutter speed being too slow and my picture being blurry. So I keep it at 6400. The next one is a little bit of a, the naming that they use, it seems to be different on every camera. Well, math, math. So but, here we're doing some algebra. But minimum, <laughs> no. minimum shutter speed is essentially the slowest speed that the camera will go to before it bumps up the ISO to the next setting up to the threshold you've set in the first option. So if you set one over F, that's one over focal length, that's gonna give you about a 30th of a second before the camera says, ah, I need to increase my ISO to keep my shutter speed no slower than a 30th. The setting that you use for this is going to depend on what it is that you're photographing along with how steady your hands are. Of course, the Q2 has optical image stabilization, which helps. It doesn't help if your subject is moving. I generally keep this on 1 over 2F. David, what do you like? Uh, no, I don't like those. So I... Tell us. <laughs> thank you. I, I What <laughs> I like is skipping that entirely. And it is interesting that they're using F as a variable focal length. And I do wonder, because we haven't put it to the test, if that changes based on the virtual digital crop mode. I'm assuming it does. Otherwise, why would they say? Yeah, I believe path? I believe it does. Yeah. I don't use the crop mode, so that's why right. I don't so know. So for me, I'm going to, for normal street shooting, walk around, I'm just going to set it to 250th. OK. Uh, and then if I have more static subjects, I know I can handhold it very reliably at 125th. But why wouldn't I want a 250th when I'm out and about? What I find to be less than ideal is the camera, especially with the 1 over F whatevers, you'll get a lot of pictures that are at a 30th of a second if you do 1 over F, or mm. 1 over 60th if you're at 1 over 2 F. Fair. And it, it, for especially for things, subjects that are moving, or you're just quickly lifting the camera up and getting a grab shot without really steadying yourself, You'd be even better served to go to 500th if you're if you're walking around, you know, hiking or doing street photography, because people don't stop and you're not stopping. So even at 250th, you might see a little bit of blur. I like to really dial that in, uh, especially given at least what I use the Q2 for, which is really just walk around, general street and travel photography, at, or adventure photography where I'm going to take it hiking or, or climbing or something like that. And I just I. I don't want to have to think about steadying it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to raise that up to, two, to let's say, uh, 250th or 500th most okay. of the time. OK, I like That's it. That's for me. No, I like it. That's great advice. I think it's going to depend on what you're photographing, but it's hard to go wrong. I would say don't put it at like a half second because <laughs> you're going to be, because the camera is trying to keep the ISO as low as it can because it's going to keep the shutter speed as close to your minimum speed as possible. So. David's right. If you put it at a 30th or 60th, you're going to be spending a lot of time there, and that may not be ideal for moving subjects. So, mm -hmm, well said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Now we've got we white have? balance is next. This, you know, I have different school of thought on. For the Q2, I keep it on auto. I know you like to set daylight sometimes, but... Um, actually, for the for the Q2 in color, yeah. I, I do like just auto. Okay. So I set... I'm a, I'm a big auto white balance person for this. Um, white balance, by the way, just since we should talk about this, is irrelevant <laughs> on the Q2 monochrome. Right, don't go looking for the setting on your Q2 monochrome. It, it doesn't exist, guys. Uh, there is no white balance. That's right. So, it has a grayscale white balance. Yes. Um, if you're shooting DNG, which you should be doing, white balance is something you can change after the fact without any impact on image quality. Therefore, I would say auto. Auto is good. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on. Oh, wait, we're on the, we're on the second page. It's very, it's very exciting. Wow. Next, we have photo file format. This is relevant to what I just talked about. You can shoot DNG, DNG plus JPEG, or JPEG only. I'm pretty much only shooting on DNG. I would say if you're going to do a lot of Leica photos, photo transmitting, OK, fine, shoot DNG plus JPEG. Otherwise, well, I don't need the JPEG file for anything. So. Right. Gonna shoot it. And interestingly, it defaults to JPEG. 
Plus DNG. Yeah, I don't know why that is. And like to torment us. Um, JPEG settings is next. This is if you have a color Q2. This is where you can change your live view and playback to black and white. If you know you're going to convert your files later, you're going to do that under film style. You're going to change it to one of the two monochrome settings. You can also have some customized settings here under the film style settings. You can actually choose contrast, highlight, shadow, sharpness. I can't say I get that deep, but if you want to tweak the way that live view and playback look, you can do that. Yeah, I would say, and, and this is something they added also with, with uh, later firmware. Um, if you want the best approximation of how you probably are going to process out your black and white files, mm -hmm. I like this monochrome HC, which stands for high contrast. Okay. And you can customize it further, but by default, it's going to look a little punchier and a little more like probably how you will process it because the standard monochrome setting is a little bit flat. So that was, and that was something that was brought in as a request from users. So you, you asked for it, like I gave it to you. And actually the next feature uh, in the menu, which is IDR, is also a feature added in firmware. I know you like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know what it actually stands for because it's intelligent. intelligent. Intelligent dynamic range, yeah. maybe? Yeah, intelligent I guess I do know. Range. Okay. Tell us about intelligent dynamic range, please. Ooh. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what IDR does, essentially what you're going to be doing in post-processing or should be doing in post-processing, is trying to maximize your highlight details and shadow details by pulling your highlights back, pulling your shadows up, and getting more information than what you can see in a standard out-of-camera image, out-of-camera. Uh, IDR is just, especially if you're shooting just in, in RAW only in DNG, this is just for your preview. It's just the thumbnail in the camera so you can get a, again, a better idea of what your finished process result is going to be. Kind of like setting, if you're shooting in DNG only and you set your JPEG film style to monochrome high contrast, well, you're not actually recording that as your file. It's just an approximation for you to see when you take a picture and it gives you a playback. And, and here you can change the settings and I would just play with this. Go out in a really high contrast scene or do it at home where you have window light coming in and flip, you know, turn off your, your inside lights and just see what it looks like of how much detail it's pulling up from the shadows. Uh, if you want, you can do high and that way you'll you will see your shadows as being a lot less blocked up, or you can just go to standard, or you can go to auto, and the camera's basically going to decide the more con in contrast, or in scene contrast there is, the stronger effect it'll give you. And if you have a very uh, even flat image, let's say everything's uh, being front lit, uh, all the same basic tones, then it's gonna dial this very low. So I would play with it, and when in doubt, just leave it to the default setting of auto. It doesn't hurt anything. Right, to be clear, this only affects JPEGs and your live view preview and your playback. If you're shooting DNG only, this does not change the actual DNG file at all. Just to be clear. Yes. The next setting is one you need to avoid. <laughs> all this can do is cause you heartache. Oh, there's my hand, sorry. Um, scene modes are JPEG only weird settings that lock you out of the majority of the menu. PASM is essentially no scene mode and it's just letting you use the camera normally. If you go in here and say, I'm gonna pick mm, landscape mode, you'll see a whole bunch of settings in the menu are grayed out because the camera is essentially do, saying, oh, well, I'm gonna make all these decisions for you. I'm gonna force you to shoot JPEG only. And that's the end of that. So you do not want your scene mode to be on anything other than PASM. Simple as that. Safety tip right there, guys. Safety tip right there. Let's keep going. Okay. Digital zoom. So the Q2 has a fixed 28 millimeter lens and short of a hacksaw, you cannot change it. I'm please joking. no, I'm no, joking. please don't, don't do that. Don't do no, that. No. Um, so <laughs> instead, <laughs> if it's not set a live stream set, I should cut the lens off. <laughs> so instead you have digital zoom, which is simulating by cropping the use of a 35, 50 or 75 millimeter lens at the cost of resolution. What's interesting about the way they do this is if you select, let's say 35 millimeter, put the lens cap back on I see here. it, you can see it. You can see it? Oh, yeah. You can see but, it But uh, the lens cap, yeah, there you go. It gives you actual frame lines, like on an M camera, with a little 35 I, um, or text here in the bottom right, so you know what focal length you're using. 
I I've never really been a huge user of these on the Q2. I'll say it is the 35 is the one I would use the most mm -hmm. because it's still 30 megapixels, so it's a usable resolution. Again, if you're shooting DNG, it's still giving you the full image. It's just it comes into Lightroom and you can crop it or uncrop it. If you know you're going to crop it, yeah, you can put it at 35. You see the frame lines and you can visualize the shot. But otherwise, I'm just going to keep it at 28 and crop later. Yeah. Now, and I'll show you one more way to get to that. Okay. So in regular view, by default, this little button right here. David has a thumbs up on this. Yeah, take that off. Yeah. I'll take it. Thank you. There we go. This little button right here, if you push it, you'll notice I'm in 35, 50, 75. And... I can definitely tell you that I have used the 35 mode probably more than, than Josh has. Mm. I like to use this a lot combined with the macro function. Okay. So if I'm shooting flowers, orchids, whatever, I find that the macro gets pretty close, but it's not quite close enough. 35, the combination of, of this crop and the macro mode just lets me hone in and get one flower. Uh, I find it great and I don't have to crop later because it comes into Lightroom pre-cropped. And if I'm off a little bit, I can just scoot that over. And I find it very useful. Like Josh said, you got 30 megapixels out of the 47 and very, very useful. I do find that as we go down, because now uh, 50 is what, 17 megapixels? Does that sound right? Oh, I can never remember, but something like that. 20, 20 something? 15. 15 megapixels now? Yep. Yeah, oh, it's 15, and then when you go one more to 75, it's 7 megapixels, right? Yeah, it's 30, seven, 15, 15, and 7. Yeah, 30, 15, and 7. And I have never used this one. I have never used the 75 mode crop. I think 7 megapixels for all but but social media or web is just way too small. We'll ask a good question, which is how does it do 4K at 75 millimeter? Well, 4K is less than... 4K I... is 8.2 megapixels. Well, how does it do it in 75? That's only 7 megapixels. What's that over there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the top video on the Q2. I don't know. Uh, I think it might only shoot 1080. I'll, I'll have to try it out. We'll have to try that out. Add it to the list. But, for the video episode. But you could shoot the other modes, probably. So Yeah. yeah. But as much as I shoot video on the SL2, or primarily SL2S, I never shoot video on the S on the on the Q2. Not that you can't. It's just I don't. Yeah, you'd have to use se separate audio. But as a backup or a companion to an SL2, could be. You know, I could ask like a B camera or something like that. Yeah. yeah. As long as you're not using, but sound becomes tricky because there's no microphone input here. So the camera does have microphones here. I know we're getting pretty off topic. The camera does have microphones, so you can use scratch audio if you have an external just handheld recorder. It's not ideal, but it you can it's serviceable if you need it. How's that? Fair enough. All right, what are we up to here? Next, so, we are on optical image stabilization. Short, the shorthand for that is OIS. Tell us about OIS. Sure. Oh, you, you, there, there we go. Uh, I just leave it auto. Auto is the default. Basically, there's a, a threshold at which it'll engage. I think that it does. it is a, a little bit of a detriment to battery life because you have the lens moving around. So at higher shutter speeds, it just doesn't engage. When you dip below, I believe, 60th of a second, it will engage in auto. That might be 60th or 30th or somewhere in that range. And then you have actually optical elements in the lens that are moving around to give you some stabilization. This is not as effective as sensor-based stabilization in the SL2, not by a long shot, but it's certainly more uh, you know, effective than the stabilization in the M because there isn't any. <laughs> There isn't any. So I just leave it alone. I don't yeah, think too much about it. If you're going to a tripod, you can turn it off. Um, if, if we make a tripod user profile, yeah. we'll turn it off yeah. because you don't want to have image stabilization when you're on a tripod. But yeah, auto is what David and I are both going to leave it on most of the time. Uh, the next setting, we have ex or ex electronic shutter. Electronic shutter, English. The default is extended. So the electronic shutter's purpose is to use shutter speeds faster than the camera's mechanical limit, which is a 2,000th of a second. The Q2 has a leaf shutter, which is awesome because it's very quiet and you could sync with flashes at any speed. But the downside of a leaf shutter is it doesn't have that super, super fast maximum or minimum, I guess. No, minimum. Minimum yeah. shutter speed uh, like you have on the M's and the SL2. So if you want to shoot faster than a 2,000th of a second, you have the camera set to extended and if you're in a situation where the camera needs to use a, sh a shutter speed faster than a 2000, it's automatically 
going to roll over from the mechanical shutter to the electronic shutter and shoot up to, I think, a 40,000 of a second? 20,000. 20,000. 20,000. I think it's 20, Something like that. that. Yeah. It's fast. It is also totally silent. This is a feature you also have in the SL2 and on the M11. The upsides being, again, that it is much faster than a mechanical shutter and totally silent. The downsides being your longest speed is limited to a second, and you have to be careful when you're photographing fast-moving objects because you may get a little bit of distortion from the electronic shutter. So if I am in an environment where I need to shoot completely silently all the time, I'm going to put it on always on. If I am in an environment where I may oh, wow. need... We're both wrong. 40 thousandth of a second. Oh, that was my first guess. Uh, so I, was, I, I should have gone with my gut. Should've, should've gone with your gut. <laughs> okay. If you just want to have it there to roll over if you need it, put it on extended. If you don't want it at all, you can turn it off. I use extended. I find it very handy. You know, if you're on the beach photographing something at 1.7, you're going to get... Because 2000 is not that fast. And I don't always have an ND filter with me. So this is a nice workaround for that. And I think it also should be noted, uh, just, again, safety tip, right? Just because, oh, there goes the camera. Just because it's a faster shutter speed, you're like, oh, wow, 40,000th of a second. I can stop a bullet with that going <laughs> through an apple. Yeah. No, that's not at all the case. In fact, the mechanical shutter at 2,000th of a second is more effective at stopping action than the electronic shutter would be at 4,000th of a second. You don't want to actually use this for fast-moving subjects. You want to use this for static subjects like a landscape on the beach, wide open at 1.7, mm -hmm. where nothing's moving very quickly. Uh, if there was a galloping horse going across that beach, <laughs> you would want to go to an ND filter at 2,000th of a second, because otherwise you could get that, what's called the jelly effect, and that's because the sensor reads out sort of top to bottom, left to right, top to bottom, in rows. So by the time it gets to the bottom, your subject has moved, and you can get that shifting effect. So mechanical shutter for fast-moving subjects, electronic shutter for not as fast-moving subjects. Yes. And don't think that faster means better. It's just, it's it's better for those scenarios, and it's fantastic to take full advantage of that f1.7 maximum aperture for sure, because that is a great feature of the Q2. But just be aware for, for subject matter, you want to be, sometimes it's better to have an ND filter and stay in their mechanical range. Moving on. Well so, said. Dan, wait, yeah, what were you got? Um, here? We've got flash settings here, which I'm just going to cover very quickly because we number one, it. we're not covering everything and anything. And number two, we don't use flash. Long story short, the most important thing to know here is if you have a flash on the camera and you want it to fire every time you take a picture, turn flash mode from auto to on. If you have flash mode on auto, it's only going to fire the flash when it thinks it needs it. In my mind, if you're putting a flash on the camera, you want it to fire every time. So put it on on on. That's the only flash mode tip I'm going to give you because David and I do not use flash. You're now on the third page of the menu. Wait. Very exciting. Okay. Now we have exposure preview. This has two settings, PAS or PASM. This is effectively describing the behavior of how the camera's live view works in manual mode. So either it's going to preview in real time the effects of whatever settings you have engaged or not. If you're shooting with external lighting, whether that's studio lighting or a bunch of flashes, you'll probably want to put it on PAS because you're most likely your settings are much darker than the, or, or much faster than the room lighting, so your live view will be very dark, making it difficult to focus and compose. Otherwise, PASM, so that way when you're in manual mode, you can see in real time the effects of your set exposure settings. Done. Yes, and I think we should come back to user profile. Yeah, I agree. We're going to skip that. We're going to skip video because we're not doing video today. Sorry. Well, video... There was a there was a request. I'm going to talk about video Ugh. about as briefly as you talk about flash, which that was is about five seconds. Ready? Okay, and go. So in video format resolution. <laughs> oh, I got to talk as fast as Josh now. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay, I can't do it. Okay. Uh, you you basically have two choices here: MOV or MP4. Uh, you want better quality MOV, and uh, Cine 4K is 4096 by 2160. It's a bit wider. 4K is really also known as UHD, which is 3840 by 2160. That's what we think of as 4K like on a television. So if you just want the normal 4K, go to 4K, and you have choices of 29, 25, or 24 frames per second. Um, it's up to you, depending on what country you're in. 25 is going to be for Europe. 
30 or 24 is going to be for the United States. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, once you switch into video, you just record. And then video settings is going to be very, very basic because we don't have all the HDMI connections or microphone in, headphone out, that or time code in that we have on the SL2. So you're just going to have microphone gain, which is your volume for your, your built-in mics, wind noise reduction, and video stabilization, which is an electronic stabilization where it sort of oversamples a little bit and tries to stabilize like a, like a GoPro. And, and then you have your video styles, which is similar to your JPEG styles. The difference is this isn't shooting in raw video. Basically, video is like JPEG, so whatever you're getting in camera is what's baked in. So here, if you set it to monochrome, you're getting black and white video, not just a black and white video preview. So you probably want to stick with standard or natural unless you are trying to shoot in black and white and then go for it. But um, you're never getting it back out of black and white. And that's it for video. Well done. That was fast. All right. How's that? Well done. All right. Next, we have capture assistance. This is what you're going to be seeing on the screen in live view. You have the grid, which is going to give you a grid overlay. You have clipping, which is going to warn you when your highlights are overexposed. You have horizon, which is a level gauge, and you have the histogram. I'm going to turn all these on and then I'm going to show you them. Uh, you can cut those on and off with the center button here. You can see I can cycle through the various display modes. The grid is always on and the other items come on depending on how I set everything. So first, we can see the virtual horizon here. If I were to turn this camera, you can see it changes. Ooh, almost got it. It's like a video game. Uh, <laughs> obviously, exactly you can see the is. grid. The grid is right there. You're not going to see the clipping warning unless I... Let's see. Let me put it in fixed aperture here and try to get, there we go. That's the clipping warning. So it's just a black blinking area that's telling you your highlights are overexposed. If I bring this back down, you can see it goes away. And histogram, of course, is in the top left. So those are your four live view aids. And again, you can cut them off except for the grid by hitting the center button. It's the, I don't know the order, but anyway, you've got four, one, two, three, four, Three. One, two, three. One, two, three. I'm thinking of the S3. <laughs> three modes. Anyway, uh, those are your capture assistants right there, which again is just describing what you're seeing. On yeah, and I'd like to give just, a, just also a couple notes here. Yes. Especially since we're, we've gone through the SL2. This, the, the Q2 is a little bit simpler in terms of the setup, and I'd like to see a little bit further options developed here to match up closer to the SL2, mm. yeah. especially if you're using both. Personally, I like to use a six by four grid on the SL2 and you only have the option for on or off here and it gives you a three by three grid. Do I use it? Yes. Would I like a six by four grid? Yes. But you know, Leica has decided that I don't need that. And the same with clipping. Uh, the clipping here is basically just a default value like 253, where on the SL2, you could change that. You could change it to 250 or 255, whatever you want. And it's also only for highlights. Correct. There's, there's no, no shadow warning. There's no shadow warning. Yeah, which is unfortunate. Um, virtual horizon is virtual horizon, and histograms that. So I, they're very useful assistants. I do use these, but I would hope that Leica, with future firmware, would add a little bit more granular control to match up closer to the SL2. We may see that, but my guess would be no, because I think they purposely try to simplify the Q2 a little bit. But who knows? Who knows? Next, we've got our just oops, sorry, I'm going out here. Our display settings. I don't often change much in here aside from the first one, which is describing the behavior of the relationship between the viewfinder, the screen, and your eyeball. So on auto, if you were to cover the eye sensor with your face or something else, it's going to switch over to the EVF. You've also got LCD, which is the mode we should be using now, and what I'll set it to, where it's disabling the eye sensor and the EVF completely. You have EVF extended, where you are going to see it in the EVF when you have the camera up to your eye. When you take the camera down from your eye, you can have the menu and playback on the screen. This is probably the mode I use the most myself. And then you have EVF, where you're only going to see it in the EVF no matter what. I don't use this because if I take the camera down from my face and I hit menu, I like to see the menu on the screen, which is where EVF extended comes into play. So I don't use auto just because I don't like the slight delay that there is with the eye sensor. It's pretty quick, but I'm faster. So <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, I think we should take a short 
break just to go over a oh, couple it's after eight already. Yeah, yeah, oh my yeah. goodness. A okay. couple things. So let me finish display settings and then Oh yeah, okay. I'm almost done. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. Oh well, the short answer, the short thing is I don't touch the other stuff in display settings. Um Jose, can you come back real quick? I leave these on the defaults. I'm not changing L C D EVF brightness. I'm leaving the frame rate at 60. Um, I don't find yeah, the, the defaults I, are good. Yeah, I don't change these here. So the only thing I'm going to change in here is is EVF LCD. Okay. So we're leaving it off of display settings now. David, we'll kick it over to you. Okay. Uh, so just wanted to one take a break so you're not staring at the back of a camera for three <laughs> hours straight. Um, gives a little breather. You know, everyone take a nice deep breath. That's right. That's right. All that. Um, and we wanted to just check in with a few news things. Yes. Um, some housekeeping. So some housekeeping. Usually we're talking about, uh, you know, sometimes we're talking about workshops and that I'm usually leaving to go to one and then, you know, coming back and having survived. Mm -hmm. But I just want to point it out because our colleague Peter has put up a whole bunch of new trips Ooh. that actually have spots available instead of everything, now. everything being sold out. <laughs> That's the normal. So I'm going to kick it over uh, to the screen here. And I did want to point out, so uh, on the Leica Star Miami site, under workshops and events and under destination workshops. You can see most of our, our stuff is, is sold out, but we do have uh, some new things listed in terms of uh, digital printing. We have still spots left for Greenland for next summer. Um, and we have also now listed Patagonia for April of 2023. And that was newly listed today, as well as a street photography workshop in Lisbon in March, and also uh, Lofoten, Norway in uh, January to early February for 2023 as well. Why is well. that one at the end? I feel like it's we can kind well, of logical order. Well, <laughs> Peter, you know, <laughs> didn't like... Crazy. We'll, we'll organize this by date okay, order. Okay. But yeah, there's my point being is these workshops sell out quick. They do. And they do. 2023 is not far away. It's three months away. Yes, yes. So here, uh, <laughs> three and a half months. Whatever. Come back to the two of us here. Well, there's another important thing. Yes. Well, hold on. But, but so... Yes, Just, so Josh's point is is correct. They sell out because they're small. Uh, yeah. We we often cap these at about ten people because we want it to be a good kind of close knit experience where you know we're not just going around in in huge buses and tour guides and all that yeah. stuff. We're going to generally uh, more remote places with less people, so it, it's quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we've already seen some people sign up for these today. So if you are interested in joining and you're frustrated that you never seem to be able to get in on one, <laughs> now's your chance. Now's your chance. Head over there. Um, we can drop a link in the comments as well so you can check out the um, the workshops and you can come travel with me or Josh. Well, not Josh. Not yet. We're, we're talking we're about work, that. We're working on that. We're working on that. We're, working on we're that. not ready. We're not ready. Uh, Peter, Kirsten, Colin. So, And also just a friendly shout out to those who were in the uh, Iceland workshop with, with Colin and Kirsten last week. Sounds like uh, I, I saw at least one person in the comments that, that attended and had a good time. So uh, sounds like uh, everyone survived this time around. It was great. Yeah. Uh, we always like that when they all come back. <laughs> Doesn't always happen, you know. Doesn't always happen. And they got some just absolutely killer Aurora shots. Multicolor Aurora. Mm. The one time I don't go to Iceland, <laughs> multicolor Aurora. If you had Aurora. been there, it wouldn't have happened. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. But you have an announcement as well. Oh, yeah. So... We do lots and lots of shows. We do shows about new products that come out. And the number one complaint that we hear the most is why is an XYZ new product available? They can't make enough. Too many people want it. Blah, blah, blah. Well, for the first time, at least at Like a Storm Amy, we have a couple of very difficult, mm. or normally difficult, to obtain items in stock. The first one would be the M11 in both colors is now in stock. Jose, you want to switch to the... Is there one with me in the computer? There is. Yeah, <laughs> there is. Yeah, there you go. So if you look at our website... Like M11, in stock, in black, and in silver. So if you are thinking about getting into your first digital M, if you want to replace your current digital M, get another digital M, whatever, M11s are in stock for now. We just got a big batch uh, last week, so this is the first time we've had them in stock. At the same time, we also have... I think we make sure we have sold out... Oh. We actually just sold out like an hour ago of Q2 Reporters, but we may be getting more. I don't really have much of a list anymore, so an hour ago they were in stock. A Q2, a Q2 monochrome is in stock, as well as every SL option. And you've got the SL family and friends promotion, which is 500 bucks off of a lens, a prime, prime lens, lens yeah. and $650 off of a body or a bundle. That ends October 31st. So 
if you are looking for any like a body, we have everything. We actually also have something else interesting in stock, which What's I just that? remembered, which is the Silver MP. Oh yeah, those we have, have been one. unavailable we have forever. Ones, I think this may be the first time in quite a while we've had the Silver MP film camera in stock. So if you're looking to dive into analog, you got a shot at it. So anyway, not to get too salesy, but this is the first time we've had the M11 in stock and it came out in January. So it's been eight months of struggling. Yeah. And finally they are available. Now, hooray. We just got to get through all the trade-ins and then, uh, you know. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> that's true, yes. So good news on the stock front. But now I think, uh, well, before we go back, Jose, yeah. are there any questions that we need to answer sure. that we have we have missed? At the top half. Mm, maybe check here. We are like super plaid today. I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jose is also in plaid. Wow. Oh. This is like, we're like the plaid oh, trio. <laughs> um, can you turn off the 75 millimeter crop so I don't have to switch it through? No. Switch no, it that would be interesting if they did that. If they got, allowed you to kind of filter through. Kind of like you have, like, yeah. imagine with exposure preview, you have PASM and PAS. I mean, if they could just toggle and say like 28, 35, 50 or 28, 35, 50, 75 or something like that, yeah. uh, that would be interesting. Or using like a favorite style menu to to toggle the focal lengths off. Because let's say you can jump between, you don't want 35, you want to jump between 28 and 50 only. I think that would be a neat feature if they had toggleable focal length choices for yeah. the uh, digital zoom. But I still want things, I guess. Uh... I always want things. That is true. That's a good suggestion, though. You know what's really interesting is the new iPhone, which just came out, is 24 <laughs> millimeters 24, now? 50. Yeah, so that's it's weird. Now. We, yeah. we had always, because the Q2, even though it's a 28, is really a slightly it's wider like than that. 20, it's like 26, 27, yeah. which is also what the iPhone, exactly. uh, at least the 13 yeah. and the other ones were. So I'm just wondering if Leica is going to see that and be like, well, our next Q2 is going to be a 24 millimeter lens, and people will go crazy. Like, no, why are you doing this? <sighs> we're not starting any rumors. <laughs> the Q3, no. which I have right here. No, kidding. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, I was at the dog. The dog ate it. Sorry. The dog ate it. Uh, okay, let's go back to the menu where we left off. Any, any other questions, Jose? No, no, it's about it. Yeah, no, I've been you answered the other well. one um, about the, the seventy-five in movie mode. Still get four. Oh, yeah, no. we're, we're gonna have to oh, play no. around with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Now, okay, the last item on page three is auto review. By default, this is on three seconds. I turn off auto review because I do it on all my cameras, with the exception of when I'm shooting on a tripod. But shooting handheld. I simply do not like to be forced to look at the photo every time I take one. I just find it slows me down and it gives me, kind of interrupts the, the shooting process. I'll also say that turning off auto review does make the camera feel a little bit snappier just because it's not trying to do one more task in between each photo, so. Fair, fair, fair. I like it off, that's just me. Although sometimes I like to have it on, just say like one second, mm. uh, so that it'll be, especially for really tricky lighting scenarios. Okay. I just like, to see, and then in the playback, I like to have the highlight warning just to see, okay, did I just completely mess this up okay, or did I okay. get it close? And I don't like it, I agree, most of the time I like it, auto review is off because it, it, it really feels instantaneous at that point. You know, there's no blackout, it just shoots between the quick focus, quick shooting. Mm. What I like about the Q2 is, is how not in the way it, it is, right? It just... Sure. Click, 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 click. Super easy. But if it's... There's two people saying they like the shutter pressed option. This is where you, if you okay. keep the shutter pressed down, it stays on. Sure. I've never gotten into that. I think it's cool that you guys like it. That's two people that like it, so... Yeah. Very cool. Maybe I'll give it a go. Wait. Okay. Next, we are now on page four of the menu. This yes, is very we exciting. We are in customized control. So I can talk about that since it's basically... I was just about to turn it over to you, so... What? <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay. <laughs> So just like I showed at the top of the show, this is just like that. So in other words, it's interesting that the Q2 sometimes gets features that were brought out on the SL2. In this case, the SL2 just got a feature that's been on the Q2. Mm. We've had this for a while now. So edit favorites is the first one. And this is the toggle kind of screen that I was talking about that would be nice for lens choices. That's not there yet. And you can just toggle on and off by clicking the right arrow button. If you click left, just it goes back a screen, right goes forward a screen, and will continue to toggle. Just be aware of that. It's a, a weird UI thing. Uh, but here you can just turn on and off a whole list of features, which will show as when you first press the menu button, you're taken to this quick visual menu. When you press it again, you're taken to the favorites menu. And the options that you see here can be cleaned up or changed 
Or if you take take all of these away and you set them all to off. This it, is what I do. I don't use the favorites menu most of the time. So what David's doing right now is what I do most of the time because it just gets me to the menu. The main I'm, menu I'm doing the Josh here. method right now. That's right. And did I get them all? If you have only one, you still see the menu. There we go. So they're all off. And now when I go, I've got my quick menu and I push again. And right now I'm in the main menu back to where I left off. There is no favorites menu anymore because we've essentially disabled it by disabling all of the options. So that's generally how we set our cameras up. But if you like to be able to access certain features like exposure bracketing or whatever, you can uh, you can set all those. Whoop, I did not want to be in camera information. Where are you there? I don't know where I am. There there we are. Are. Okay. Um, function button assignment. So this function button right here, this function button on top right here, and this function button right here can all be assigned on the Q2 and Q2 monochrome. So we've got three assignable buttons. Not quite as many as the six that are on the SL2, but this is a much smaller, simpler camera. So you can change the available options for this function button right here. Uh, so let's say that I only want to have, I don't want exposure metering. I don't want white balance because I don't care about that. Uh, I don't care about scene modes. These are very interesting. I don't care about photo file format. So they really, by default, put on a lot of the options that neither of us <laughs> ever use. They're funny like that. Uh, like a photos, no. Okay. So let's say I want, and format card, by the way, is a very, very dangerous thing to put on a function button because when you're working quickly and you accidentally push and hold something instead of clicking it, you do not want to format your card. So that, that is definitely something where I want to definitely go into the menu, scroll to it, and know that I am purposely formatting my card, not by accident. Uh, drive mode, yes. So I would say um, drive mode, self-timer for sure. And I don't think we need that. Exposure compensation, sure. ISO, yes. And can you think of other ones that you would put? I think that's pretty much Maybe maybe image stabilization. Um, I mean, it's going to depend on my user profile. For example, like sure. if I've got the tripod one, I may put something specific on there because the favorites menu is saved in your user profiles. So you can have four different favorites menu configurations based on your profile. I just always turn it off. I don't know. I, I just my style. I think maybe not the favorites. This was so we're talking about function. Oh, function. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So, I'm sorry. So if you come and take a look at this, um, what I've done is. I went through the customization that you just saw, and now when I push the function button to assign it, so a long press can assign the function button. You don't need to keep holding it. And I can switch between drive mode, self-timer, exposure compensation, ISO, very nice, stabilization, and user profile. Most of the time, let's say if I'm in, going to be doing a lot of landscape work, it's nice to just be able to click this mm. and self-timer there without having to dig through the menu. Or let's say I'm changing ISO quite a lot, I could use it here. But usually I'm assigning ISO control to to this uh, wheel assignment. Yeah, because then you can just tap the you tap the button and you're already on the wheel. So you can just right. tap it and change and it. And just like the function button, and this is kind of interesting because this is more granular than the SL2. With the SL2, the FN button assignment applies to all of the function buttons. On here, it only applies to this back function button. The right wheel button would be this right here, the, the button on top of your thumb wheel. And here, again, you can go through this list and toggle your choices on or off. So let's say that I would never set that to self-timer because I'm going to set this to self-timer. Mm -hmm. So maybe I only want to toggle between ISO and drive mode for the top button. That, that would be a reasonable choice. And on the back, I just want it, say, self-timer or maybe use it as toggle for image stabilization. So those are all personal choice and what you want to set it up as. Uh, and then the zoom lock button. No, you missed wheel assignment. Well, OK. Yeah, wheel assignment is going to be this wheel here. Um, exposure compensation, you can set it always onto exposure compensation. In aperture priority and in program, this by default is going to be exposure compensation if you're in auto. In, no, 
You're, no? you're wrong on that one. Is that I'm incorrect? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, please. please. No, well, like, well, well. I, the reason I, I know this so well is because I spent a lot of time talking about this. Oh, okay. At one of the boot camps a couple years ago. Yeah, go, go. So let me um, turn my camera on and just cut cut you off for a second here. So the this is this can get you in trouble if you're not careful, which is why I sort of think about this. Now, in auto, the function of the thumb dial, this top dial, changes based on whether you're in program, aperture, shutter speed, shutter priority, or manual mode. In program mode, it does what's called program shift, which wow. is like a semi-manual override of the program settings, so you could stop down your aperture. In aperture priority, it is exposure compensation, but in manual mode or in shutter priority mode, it actually allows you to choose third stop shutter speeds in between whatever mm. the dial is set to. It also allows you to activate the slower than one second or faster than 2000 shutter speeds if you're in shutter priority or manual. Yeah. So yeah. if you set it on exposure compensation, you are losing out on the ability to do that using the thumb dial and you have to go into the touch sensitive quick menu to do it. Personally, I'm really only using aperture priority mode or manual mode. I'm not gonna need exposure compensation in manual mode because I'll just change my aperture or shutter speed or ISO accordingly. I'm not going to need compensation. So I keep it on auto because I know that I'm going to want to have access to those more granular shutter speed selections in shutter priority or in manual mode. I'll show you real quick how that works. Let's see that. If I put it on auto and I'm going to put this on one plus, for example, and I turn my thumb wheel, now I can, I don't know if you can see this here. Well, why don't you go to the, the, can you go see it from the oh, quick menu? Yeah. yeah. So now I if I can choose no it doesn't work like that because uh, yeah it's a little yeah. bit you have to just look right Put here. Put the lens cap back on. Yeah, you can see. <laughs> it's so yeah, yeah, distracting. Yeah, it's very distracting. Okay, this is better. So if I put the shutter speed dial on, see if we can show you that one plus. See that? I can then use the thumb dial to choose shutter speeds longer than one second. If I were to set the wheel assignment on exposure compensation. All I'm doing now is I'm compensating my exposure. I've lost access to those slower speeds from the dial. I have to go to the menu. I have to tap on the one second here, and then I can change. I can use this for longer speeds. Um, so you still have access to it. It's just an extra step. Um, so I always like to keep it on auto because when I'm in shutter priority, which is almost never, but manual, which is sometimes, I want to have the ability to get to those slower speeds. Or if you are on... 2000, like so, and we have our electronic shutter. Yeah, we have the customized control wheel assignment on auto. I can now access those faster speeds up to a 40,000th. You can also, if you are in, let's say, a 500th, because the shutter, the dial only has full stops. So you can go 500, 250, 1000. But if I want to get to, let's say, a 320, I can simply turn my dial oh, and okay. I have access to the third stops, it won't go past that. It won't go to the next click stop on the shutter speed dial. It only gives you the third stop increments in between on either side. So 320, 400, here we go, 500, 64 to 800. So this is how you get third stop shutter speeds on the Q2. Again, if you set your dial to be exposure compensation all the time, you have to go into the menu and then you have to go in here to get to it. So it's much slower. Wow. Short rant, but rant over. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, I just, I happen to like that feature a lot. And I just, I know the the mindset is oh, you always want that wheel to be exposure compensation. But really, do you really know? You really only want that in average priority mode, which is where we spend wow. most of our right. time. Right. I pretty much only ever use my Q2 in aperture priority. Yeah. So for me, that wheel yeah. is always. And if you're, just to address TJ saying he does use it in manual mode, right. that's fine. Put it on the function button. Right. Or put it on either one of these function buttons or put it in your favorites menu or do it from the quick menu. I just don't like to give up such a cool control that I use. Now, you may not care. You may not need those extra shutter speeds or whatever. Then no, you can- I'm impressed. You can change yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can change it. But that's where that, I just want to you guys to be aware of what you're losing and gaining based on how you change nice. the wheel assignment. So- Okay. Anyway, that was that was my real start. And here I was. I'm like, gloss right I had to interrupt. It. I was like, no, this is I an know. important one. This is an important one. Wow. So. Let's, wow. uh, why That's you, great. Why All right. Pop back into the zoom. So there's one more, zoom one more lock. setting in this menu, mm -hmm. which is the zoom lock button, which is going to be this button right here. Let me catch it in the light so you can see that button right there. That's the zoom lock button, uh, which is essentially your third function button. And uh, this is much more limited. You can't assign this to that many things, except 
basically digital zoom, which is default behavior to switch between your 35, 50, 75 digital crops. Uh, or you can set it in any combination of um, autofocus lock, auto exposure lock, um, or sorry, just, yeah. It, it, I don't really use that. Um, you you can, and I think we can, can you set this using AF lock? It's not ideal. It's not exactly back it's, button it, focus. It's not, because no. it only locks it, and then you have to unlock it, and right. it's not. It's not the it's, same thing. It's really clunky. I do not use it. What we would like to see. Yes. What we would like to see. We. <laughs> well, we there we are. Well, we would like to see. Oh, there's a sleeve over there. That, that was the safe word, we. Um, <laughs> what we would like to see is an option for actual back button autofocus on the Q2, um, just like the ESL, because there really isn't a reason why it couldn't do it. Yeah, just their functionality is not. It's just not designed it that way. It would be great to just see a little. The other thing is, this is not as nearly as nice of a button as the joystick is on no, the, on the no, SL2. No. So if, I don't know, I, part of me says, I wish they did it. The other part of me says, if they did it, I wish the button was a little bit beefier. But to be able to disengage, because well, I, I guess there's this, right? You can't change it to manual focus when the dial's in autofocus. Yeah, it's not. And and it's a mechanical dial. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it'll be a little bit tricky. Yeah. I'd like to see the very smart engineers in Germany. Yeah, there's a way, but they probably won't do it just because they're, they're trying to keep the Q2, I think, a little more streamlined. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. I have to very, very often. And it's true also that if you had the thumbs up on the camera, it becomes a little bit tougher to. Yes, that's true. So if you were using back button focus, let's say this, they were to add that feature, right. you probably wouldn't have a thumbs up on there. The thumb support has the button like pass through, which I find very clunky. Yeah. So I don't think we're ever going to see it, but you know, it's nice to have dreams, I guess. Um, yeah. And if you are wearing gloves at all, this this button is almost impossible to press. Yeah. So, oh, but, well. but the thing is, if the button was easier to press, right, we hit then you hit it all the time. Yeah. We got to keep going because we're right. I know it feels it feels early. But we started an hour okay. earlier, so we're not so, going to go until ten o'clock. <laughs> we are not. We are not. So just working down here, uh, we've got the like of photos, uh, which is just like everything else. We're and gonna you, do a photos app episode, so we're not gonna spend much time. Just on know that there is that is where you. Well, that's where you connect your phone uh, to the Leica Photos app or iPad, and we're moving on. So yeah, you you can turn it on off there. We'll we should do an episode dedicated just to photos and we will. yeah, and how to how to do all the cameras. But it's a little involved, and it really depends on your hardware and all that stuff. So we're gonna gloss over that for now, right. and we'll come back at a later just date because we're running out of time. So. Yeah. The other thing, uh, really easy, you can edit the file name where you can change the first the letter. The first letter. What the, what the I know. <laughs> like, so dumb. if you try to see if I just change Ugh. things here. It's annoying. It's kind of funny because only the first letter is changing. <laughs> Why even bother? The good news is I don't have to hit backspace. You can pretty much that's just, right, just change. Yeah. yeah, that's silly. So, I, I don't know. I could just do D for David, David camera and right. Josh could do J for Josh camera. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And there you go. Now it's D whatever. Yeah, it's really strange. Um, or more likely, I'd probably set this to Q and then have my SL files as L. But metadata is metadata. I don't really need that. Um, you can re also reset the the file numbering if you want, yes or no. Back, it just resets back to 0001. Mm -hmm. um, power saving, I'm going to let Josh talk about. Sure. So in power saving, we've got three options. One is what I call problem mode. You put it in power saving mode, the camera starts <laughs> acting super weird. It's constantly turning <laughs> off. It's constantly making it's no, 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 no. I'll say this again. Don't go out with just one battery. Don't be cheap on spare batteries. I refuse to photograph around battery life. I refuse to go on some super exotic trip somewhere, take time off of work and whatever, only to spend the first half of the day shooting at whoever I want, and the second half of the day, like, well, I don't know if I need to shoot this because I want to save battery. No, screw that. I bring like four batteries with me, so power saving mode does not exist in my world. So don't use it. I don't know why it's here. I, if you're like on a stranded on an island somewhere and you have to take that one last photo, fine. But I feel like you should be focused on trying to eat and not take pictures. But you know, wow, yeah, I'm okay. Saying. And make sure you have a volleyball. Oh yeah, <laughs> auto power off. I always put it on ten minutes because it's the longest amount of time. And the same thing with all displays auto off. You've seen our cameras like just powering down all the time as we try to show it. That's super annoying. Anyway, that's it for power saving. 
Acoustic Seagull is. is all the noises. Turn it off. Uh, I just turn them all off. The only time that I would consider turning this on is if I was, I knew I was going to be using the electronic shutter in the extended mode a lot if I'm in a really bright situation and I wanted there to be a shutter sound when the electronic shutter goes off so that maybe if I had an assistant with me or a model or whatever, they would know when pictures are being taken. Well, and especially if you have auto review turned off, yeah. you have no idea Yeah. So you've even taken So the electronic shutter sound, it can be convenient. Uh, otherwise, no, I'm not gonna use it. So I turn all these off, the defaults are fine. What we Play got? mode setup. Uh, this one can get you in trouble if you're not paying attention to it. Um, group display mode is the dumbest way to explain what the setting does, <laughs> which is when you take a burst of images, it groups them all together like in, in like a little movie. So oh. you, instead of seeing the images just one after another, there's a big play button and you play it like a, like a flip book. Ugh, don't do that. No, that's dumb. So I just want to see all the images just one after the other. So on the original queue, this was default on and like I got smart and turned it default off on the queue too. So thank you for that. Clipping and histogram, same functionality that you got in Live View. It's giving you highlight, uh, overexposure warning, and a histogram or during playback. So on Definitely the SL, yes. yes, yes, yes. On the SL2 cameras, that is all done in the Info Profiles menu, which are mirrored in Live View and Playback. On the Q2, they've separated the Live View settings and the Playback settings into two separate menus. I'm not sure why they're different, but so be it. That's how we are. Um, format card, self-explanatory. That's going to wipe everything that's on the memory card. You'll do this before you prepare a card for a firmware update or when you truly have backed up all your photos more than once, you can wipe the card, just start shooting again or be like David and just have one memory card every time you go out and have a stack of 10,000 cards floating around. I'm going to power through. Yes, there's a lot. Yes, I see. Get out of here. <laughs> I'm going to power through the last few and then I'm going to bring up David to talk about user profiles because that's the good stuff. Uh, camera information is where we view and update our firmware. We have a whole episode about that. You should watch it. Date and time is where you set the date and time. Self-explanatory. The language is the language. Really? Explanatory, Tell yes. me more about that. Pixel mapping. If you notice any dead pixels, either spots or lines on your camera, pixel mapping, which does uh, automatically happen every two weeks on the camera, it just remaps the sensor and will eliminate that. I haven't experienced this yet. In the instruction manual, it says that cosmic radiation is your biggest fear for dead pixels. And literally, wow. the phrase cosmic radiation does appear in the instruction manual. Uh, so you can use pixel mapping. What about solar flares? Well, I think it falls under the, yeah, yeah, okay. um, the okay. umbrella of that. So this was added in firmware. Again, I haven't used it, but it's there. Well, that's a quick skim of the last page. Now we're going to talk, and we're going to end the show with user profiles. User profiles, which nice. is a hugely important an underutilized feature on all Leicas, Q2 included. I'm going to kick it over to David and have him kind of explain. Sure. First, just give us a quick understanding of what a user profile is, and yep. let's set up a couple. Okay. So user profile is going, they're memory banks. And here you can see that we've got a bunch of grayed out ones, right? So we have one. Well, actually, that's default. Uh, no, one, two, three, four, five, six possible Profiles. I think it's a bit much. Uh, you probably can get this done with just you know two or three, or one or none. Uh, you can easily use this camera without user profiles. You do not have to use them. That's why there's none built in. You don't have to worry about it. Default profile will always reset you back, basically to factory settings without resetting the camera. It's a little. It's sort of like a another yeah, reset. Got, if your if your camera is acting funny, you and you don't want to reset it because you're going to reset the date and the time and yep. the all that stuff. You could just do default profile, which brings the settings to default from the factory without actually resetting the entire camera. Correct. Correct. Back over to David. So it's it's like a almost reset the camera. What about ion storms, Mark says? True. That is... Isn't that how the Fantastic Four got their powers? I feel like... You know. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Only comic book characters <laughs> get superpowers from things that would kill everybody I know, else. Right? See, it's yeah. totally unfair. Yeah. Radiation. We're tangent. Okay. We're tangent. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So the way to create a profile First is you want to set all the settings that you think you want before you do this. Well, did you explain a user, what a user profile actually is? It stores a yeah. group of settings yes. in these different memory banks that you can recall later. So for instance, let's say you have a black and white street photography profile. Okay. Or maybe you have a landscape on a tripod profile. Okay. In fact, why don't we set 
let's set those up as, yeah. as a good example, okay? So we're gonna do two, pro David's gonna set up two profiles. One's gonna be for black and white street shooting and the other is gonna be for tripod landscape. Mm -hmm. So let's do street shooting. Let's do it. Okay, so drive mode, you know what? Let's live a little bit. We're gonna do medium. Ooh, bold. Me medium speed, I know. Okay. Bold choice, right? Okay. Like Focusing, there we go. I know, I'm gonna do it. You are, just, do it. you are dominating I'm living, first. I'm, I'm living on the edge living right on now. the edge there. And we're gonna do face detection, okay? Nice, nice, nice. Okay. We'll uh, probably turn our AF, AF lamp off so nobody sees that's you. That's right. I want to be discreet. Discreet. Yep. Uh, touch AF and EVF. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Okay. But I'm going to turn it off on the screen. Well, actually, no. I'm going to leave it on the screen because maybe I want to be stealthy and just yeah. tap the screen yeah. without looking through the viewfinder. Or if you pop up into the Photos app, you're going to want that for sure. I definitely will. Cool. Okay. And then autofocus tracking position. I'm going to do... Uh, yeah, let's do back to center because that means that... One subject's going to pass through the frame, and I want to acquire the next subject quicker without having to go back to the middle. Okay. So we're going to go center. Cool. Okay, so focusing is all set. Exposure metering, love highlight weighted. Going to stick with that. Exposure compensation, I think I'm going to do minus one because I want to make sure I'm shooting quickly. Mm -hmm. I may not have the chance to really adjust and fine-tune my exposure, and I want to err on the side of protecting my highlights. Okay. Okay? Auto ISO for sure. And I already have this set up. I'm going to keep this at, you know what? A thousandth of a second. Wow. I want to make sure that I'm stopping that motion, okay. whether okay. I'm moving or my subject's moving. Okay. Okay. I like it. Uh, white balance, AWB, file format, all the same. But let we were talking about doing this in monochrome, right? So yeah, let's, this is black and yeah, white. Yeah, yeah, this is black and white. So let's do monochrome high contrast. And I'm going to change this. Yep, monochrome high contrast. And let's say, but I am going to bring up my shadows a little bit. Uh, as you can see here, and let's control my highlights a little bit. Okay, so let's do that. All right, now I've I've tweaked my film setting there. IDR, we're going to, yeah, keep it on auto. Here we go. And optical stabilization. Oh, again, auto is fine. Extended for shutter is fine. And now we're going to go to user profiles. Or actually, wait, let's first yeah. capture assistance. Uh, yeah, I'll do grid, definitely clipping, virtual horizon, but I don't care about the histogram on this. All right, and I think I got everything, right? Well, don't forget about... Favorites. Well, display settings in case you want to have EVF extended. It's true, true, true. So let's yeah. do EVF there extended. I like that. All right, and we could do capture assistance. Or sorry, not capture assistance. We could do... We could customize all the controls here at the same time, but for the sake of expediency, I'm going to leave that out. Basically, the point is, any of these settings that I change here will be stored in the user profile. So now let me go to user profile, and I'm going to go to manage profiles. And what I'll do is I'll save this as a new profile. And let's set it, let's say that I, I'm not going to use this all the time. I'm going to set it as user, user 2. So I'll save it as user 2. And I'm going to go back into manage profiles. And what I'll do is I'll rename that now. So my user 2 and I can use the screen right here. And I'm gonna call it uh, BW. See earlier comment about fat fingers, <laughs> okay? So we're gonna do BW, and I can't do a space. Oh, space is right there. Yeah, you gotta, yeah. BW, yeah I gotta really want it. Oh, you gotta want it, you gotta okay. want it. And I'm gonna do BW blah, 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 blah. street, or at least try, okay? Boom. Check the box. Now I've got a user profile called BW Street. And in fact, when I go to the quick menu, do we have it? Right here, the little person icon shows me black and white street right there and default profile, which would just reset the camera back. Now, in an ideal scenario, you're going to set up a profile for every different way you might use the camera. Because let's go back just to default profile. And you'll notice now it's in color <laughs> for one. Uh, all of those settings have been changed. But if I go back now to black and white street, you will notice, you notice that I don't see the display because I'm in the EVF extended, right? I'm not actually seeing the screen. That's part of how we set up the profile. And, uh, but it's in black and white, as you can see, because I took a picture. And one thing David didn't do just for expediency was sure. he didn't set his um, function buttons for the, which are also profile specific. It, Again, correct. we're just giving an example of how to how to create a user profile. Obviously, don't 
take this as the word of the way to do it. This is just giving you guys a, a, a right. starting point. You can do user profiles for as few as one or two changes, yes. as many as you want, if you're just looking to streamline your switching between the various types of photography you're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We talked about this last time, but I'll talk about it again. Like You can literally have a profile that has single shot AFS and one that has medium high speed AFC. You could just have those two and that'll save you the trouble of having to change those two settings every time. Yes. And you, you could just bounce between user profiles and you're between those well, two Well, let me, I'll show the one more example. So yeah. I'm going to take this as a basic one and I'm just going to make some changes and we'll make a landscape profile out of this. So we'll call it tripod. Okay. So let's go back to here and I'm back in my main menu and I'm going to go to drive mode and uh, I'm going to go to single, although maybe you went bracketing, but let's stick with single for the baseline and self timer is going to automatically be on two seconds. Focus mode, we're going to set it to AFS. Mm -hmm. And of course, the one thing you can't store in a user profile is, is manual your, focus. Yeah. Manual. <laughs> like a little yeah. arm comes out and like turns <laughs> into you. Yeah, exactly. A robot. <laughs> <laughs> New firmware feature. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Uh, yep, that's fine. And then exposure metering is still highlighted. Uh, let's say we, you know, minus a third. Let me talk about something while you're making a few changes here. Someone asked if you could import a user profile from someone. Mm, yep. You can, because you can export these profiles to a memory card. What's important to remember, to keep in mind with any of Leica's cameras is you. it's not one profile at a time. It's all or nothing. It's a whole so if they were to export profiles. his profiles, let's say he had two and you had five on your camera and you imported his, his two are going to overwrite all of your profiles. Correct. So that's where it gets a little dangerous with sharing profiles if you're not aware of that. You want to back up your own profiles separately somewhere first, ideally in the cloud, and then import the other profiles because you. But you can't, can't merge. There's no way to merge them at the correct. Point. Correct. That would be cool to have like a import a, one. Yeah, profile. or like, like an app, like in the Photos app, where you could like. That would be like, awesome. Alas, doesn't you exist cannot. yet. You cannot. All right, back here. Yeah, here we go. So we're gonna finish this. So ISO. I'm gonna go to ISO 100 because I'm gonna have a fixed ISO on my camera for low shutter speed on a tripod. Uh, we don't care about auto ISO. For I'm going to go to daylight white balance, which I covered a lot of landscape shooting. I prefer daylight as a kind of a known quantity for changing light. Photo file format's fine. Uh, JPEG settings, I'm going to go and change this from film style back to standard. IDR, we can still leave it on auto. Uh, electronic shutter is fine still. Image stabilization, we're going to turn it off because mm -hmm. we're on a tripod. Mm -hmm. And exposure previews, fine, 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 fine. Uh, let's see, capture assistance. Here, I'm going to want my histogram on. That's fine. And uh, display, we're going to set it on auto. And I'll leave a three second auto review on. And let's just, and then let's say power saving. Uh, we'll just turn it off, but auto power off. I'll set it to, let's say, 10 minutes since I'm going to be leaving this on a tripod a lot. Mm -hmm and displays off in five minutes. And let's say, uh, no, we don't need that. Do, 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 do. Okay, so we're good. good. So we're gonna go back to our user profiles and I'm gonna manage profiles again. I'm gonna save this as number three. And that's arbitrary, I don't. It doesn't matter, it's yeah. just, we're just giving you examples here. Okay, and I'm gonna rename number three now and I will call it tripod. Of course, I made it all caps because I'm yelling. <laughs> tripod! Tripod! <laughs> you, can, uh, you can make it all caps. You can yeah. make it upper lower. Here, you can see that I've done that. And now when I go back, no, you'll notice the self-timer's on. When I go here, I've got my BW street. I've got my tripod setting, yelling, and I've got default. <laughs> so if I go to back on my street. Again, remember this turned off because we have it set to EVF extended. If I go back to my menu and I set it to tripod mode, now you'll see that I have my self timers activated, my grids up, my histogram is up, and I'm at ISO 100, etc. So it's really, and you can come back to the, the wide shot. It's really handy when, especially when you're using your camera for more than one type of photography. Mm -hmm. So I often like to use my Q2 monochrome for you know, walkabout stuff, but I also will use it for more purpose-driven landscape photography, um, so it's nice to be able to switch quickly. We're almost out of time. You should pop on the Kitty Monochrome and quickly show what's different about it. It's black and white. Yep. <laughs>
I'm gonna put a header in there. Don't forget. Yeah, yeah. Um, just because the QG Monochrome has a couple of unique settings, and I just we'll, we'll use the last couple of minutes to to quickly go through those, just so you can see what is different. Again, fundamentally, it is the same camera, other than a few you know minor tweaks, like the sensor being black and white. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's shocking. It's spooky. Shocking news. Uh, do you have a fresh battery though? Uh. Is there one in here? Yeah, yeah, you can take that one. That one. There you go. There's so many batteries and they're all dead. Well, did you make sure it works? Nope. <laughs> You're doing great. Thanks. Good. Well, that usually it's the best part to put it on the right. Uh, put it on the tripod first, and then you know, ask questions later. Exactly. Oh, look at that! It's fresh. This one's also been factory reset, just so we could have a, a good starting place. Perfect. Well, not a good one, actually, a worse one. Yeah. Well. Um, the same as what everyone else could have if they all did a reset. Right. So yeah. you see, I've got a reset here, a reset yeah. camera. So yeah. we, we did this before the show. We reset all the cameras on the table. Yeah. Which makes me a little sad because, you know, <laughs> it's my camera. Now I have You'll to reset it up. Fine. Let's uh, just show them specifically what's different about the... Wait, why is it in black and white? Uh, it's no, broken. It's okay. broken. All right. So what do we want to see that is that is different? Well, a couple things. Okay. Well, there's no white balance for one. Right. We're in the favorites menu. Nope. <laughs> yep. So drive mode, obviously we've got uh, the same. We don't have to cover all the same yep. stuff. Just... Same stuff. Self timer focusing, and let's go to. Okay, JPEG settings is going to be different. This is where the difference. Yep. Is, yeah. So instead of um, film style, you see toning, and here we have the option. Even though the sensor is purely black and white, the screen is actually full color, hence why there's a red icon here, and we can store, say, sepia, the weak version. Sepia strong version, blue weak, blue strong, selenium weak, selenium strong. So you have some choices. And again, this is going to only affect the JPEG if you're shooting in JPEG plus DNG or the preview in camera if you're shooting in DNG only. But that won't translate over when you bring it into Lightroom, Photoshop, Capture One, et cetera. It will only be for playback and review in the camera, not the other way. But it's nice, again, if you think you're always going to put a sepia tone on your final prints, this is a nice way to preview what that effect is going to look like. And that is there. You can also customize image properties. Now, again, controlling the JPEG or the image playback and preview that you have for DNG. And this is similar to what I showed you in the Q2, which is you have contrast, sharpness, shadow, and highlight, and uh, you can control those separately to to affect your combination between the toning and then controlling the contrast sharpness shadow and highlight recovery uh in the image properties and I'm trying to think an idr is the same well there's only one other uh, well, there's see. no additional features but there's two features that the q2 monochrome doesn't have that the q2 does have yep one is obvious which is white balance the other is less obvious which is tracking autofocus oh there is no tracking focus on the q2 because tracking focus uses color as part of its tracking methodology, and because there is no color, there you, go. you don't have tracking. This is just something that the Q2 monochrome doesn't have. So if you use tracking a lot, there you go. Don't use a Q2 monochrome. Get a Q2 and convert to black and white. Um, another interesting thing is the default ISO maximum for auto ISO on the Q2 is 6400, like we saw. Mm -hmm. It's 25,000 on the Q2 monochrome. So like actually, like is actually making a decision for you. Wow. Uh, preemptively, so they're very clever Wait. like that. So. Which is it? Is it because I said 25,000? Oh, I think so. Yeah, they, they called you up in yeah, Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, you know, <laughs> David said 25,000 it is. Anyway, so that's just the quick differences with the key to monochrome. That's it. I think we've actually done a pretty good job. I know we didn't talk about Photos app because that'll be a separate episode um, where we have like an iPad and go crazy. Um, it is a cool different we, icon too on the screen. We will <laughs> do more of these over time. We'll do one on the M11. We'll sure. do one on the M8. Probably, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> M10. <laughs> and the M10 monochrome, M10R. And I know, I'm not sure what else, but time will tell. Um, but for sure, we are enjoying this series. We like the idea of kind of bringing our hands-on experience with the menus of these cameras to you guys. But of course, as firmware changes come out, there'll be new settings. Settings will change, and we'll try to address those. And I'm just saying right now, if Leica comes out with a firmware <laughs> update for the Q2... Hey, next week. The, the next week. It's going to be, just watch, like in I'm two gonna, days, there's going to be firmware update. It's going to be like, all why? new, all new changes. Why? Well, I'll just go back and do it again.
I, maybe they're messing with us. I, I, that's it, yeah. yeah. I don't know what our next show is either because we have a lot of things happening. I'm going to be off for a bit. You're going to be traveling. Yes. Where are you going? To Scotland? I'm going to uh, Scottish Highlands, Isle of Skye, and then immediately following that, Kirsten and I will be leading that, that landscape photography photography trip, I can speak. Okay. Uh, and then we both are going to be going immediately from Scotland over to Dublin, Ireland for mm. the LHSA annual meeting, which yes. is actually in exotic Dublin. Very so nice. I'll be gone uh, more than two weeks. Will you miss me? No. <laughs> okay. Will you miss me? <laughs> no. Of course I'll miss you, David. Who's going to troubleshoot all the problems I have with IT at the store when you're not around? Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which I guess... I don't know if it's too late to sign up for the Dublin trip with LHSA or not, but if you are LHSA.org, LHSA yep. there might still be time to sign up for the, the Dublin uh, meeting, which should be really, really cool. It's the first time that LHSA has had their annual meeting in, in Ireland. They've had a couple in, in Wetzlar in Germany, but I don't think they've ever had one in Ireland. So this would be uh, pretty cool. The, uh, the Emerald Isle, as it were. That's going to be fun. And don't yes. forget, you have been anxiously waiting for the Leica M11 to be in stock at Leica Star Miami. It now is, yes. along with Q2, Q2 Monochrome, Silver MP, bunch of lenses, 50 Apo, et cetera, et cetera. So, and all new destination trips, too. Yes. And Peter just uploaded a bunch of workshops. So it is a good time to be perusing the Leica Star Miami. It's always a good time. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I think we've covered it. Sign us off. Yeah. All right. Well, if you have any questions that we didn't address, which it's impossible because we did address everything <laughs> except course, photos. Of course, of course. Photos and flash. Photos and flash, it's like off the table, right? Okay, for now. And listen, I actually talked about video for all of 23 uh, seconds. It's the most we've done. We will eventually do a video episode. 2020. Yeah. Oh, I think our mics are malfunctioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, something's happening here. Yeah. Solar flares, right? Yeah, ion, storm. ion storms, yeah. Ion storms. <laughs> all right, well, uh, thanks for sticking with us. Hope that all the, the Q2 and Q2 monochrome owners out there got some kind of valuable information. I certainly learned all about the uh, the wheel assignment. <laughs> look I had no, look at me. I, I didn't know that. Well, so okay. I learned something new. Hopefully you guys learned something new as well. And um, uh, yeah, this was this was informative and fun for all of us. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing more, like Josh said, on on other cameras, M cameras for sure. And uh, we will check the schedule. But definitely subscribe to Red Dot. Uh, Red Dot Forum on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Make sure to click the notification bell so when we actually decide when we're going to do another episode, mm -hmm. you will know when. Yes. You will be alerted yes. uh, probably beforehand and then also when we go live. Uh, make sure to check out red.forum.com. We've got a lot of the content and articles that we talked about during the show up on there. You can find the latest versions of firmware, details of what all the different firmwares do for all the different cameras. We have all detailed out. So definitely check that out. And even if you want to see ISO comparisons of these two cameras at every ISO value, you can do that too. It's there. So lots and lots of resources for you. Uh, and also be sure to check out our previous videos on the channel because we have covered all of this stuff in excruciating detail. <laughs> um, but other than that, uh, always big thanks to Josh. Thank you to Jose. And thanks for you guys for tuning in and joining us on this Sunday night. Random. I'm also curious, drop a comment. Mm. Do you like Saturday nights where the, the previous way? Or do you like us talking stuff on Sunday nights at a slightly earlier time? So if we kind of feel this out, see how uh, different schedules work for everybody now that uh, everyone's getting back in the world and traveling again and all that. So please let us know. We are very interested to hear your thoughts on it. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, have a not much less of the weekend left. Depends on where you are in the world. Your weekend could be over already. Maybe it's over. Maybe you're ready at work watching this. Yeah. So get back to work. <laughs> All right. Away. Well, thanks a lot, guys. And we will see you in the next episode. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Yeah.